Section 14 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Brother by Madeline Z. Doty It was a warm summer's day in late August. No men were visible in the Belgian hamlet. The women reaped in the fields, the insects hummed in the dry, warm air. The house doors stood open. On a bed in a room, in one of the cottages, lay a woman. Beside her sat a small boy. He was still but alert. His eyes followed the buzzing flies. With a bit of paper he drove the intruders from the bed. His mother slept. It was evident from the pale, drawn face that she was ill. Suddenly the dreaming, silent summer day was broken by the sound of clattering hoofs. Someone was riding hurriedly through the town. The woman moved uneasily, her eyes opened. She smiled at the little boy. "'What is it, dear?' The boy went to the window. Women were gathering in the street. He told his mother and hurried from the room. Her eyes grew troubled. In a few minutes the child was back, breathless and excited. "'Oh, mother, mother, the Germans are coming!' The woman braced herself against the shock. At first she hardly grasped the news. Then her face whitened, her body quivered, and became convulsed. Pain sprang to her eyes, driving out fear. Beads of perspiration stood on her forehead. A little animal cry of pain broke from her lips. The boy gazed at her, paralyzed, horrified. Then he flung himself down beside the bed and seized his mother's hand. "'What is it, mother? What is it?' The paroxysm of pain passed. The woman's body relaxed. Her hand reached for the boy's head and stroked it. "'It's all right, my son.' Then, as the pain began again, "'Quick, Sonny, bring Auntie.' The boy darted from the room. Auntie was the woman doctor of B. He found her in the square. The townspeople were wildly excited. The Germans were coming. But the boy only thought of his mother. He tugged at Auntie's sleeve. His frenzied efforts at last caught her attention. She saw he was in need and went with him. Agonizing little moans issued from the house as they entered. In an instant, the midwife understood. She wanted to send the boy away, but she must have help. Who was there to fetch and carry? The neighbors, terrified at their danger, were making plans for departure. She let the boy stay. Through the succeeding hour, a white-faced little boy worked manfully. His mother's cries wrung his childish heart. Why did babies come this way? He could not understand. Would she die? Had his birth given such pain, if only she would speak? And once, as if realizing his necessity, his mother did speak. It's all right, my son. It will soon be over. That message brought comfort, but his heart failed when the end came. He rushed to the window and put his little hands tight over his ears. It was only for a moment. He was needed. His mother's moans had ceased, and a baby's cry broke the stillness. The drama of birth passed. The midwife grew restless. She became conscious of the outer world. There were high, excited voices. Wagons clattered over stones. Moving day had descended on the town. She turned to the window. Neighbors with wheelbarrows and carts piled high with household possessions hurried by. They beckoned to her. For a moment the woman hesitated. She looked at the mother on the bed, nestling her babe to her breast. Then the panic of the outside world seized her. Quickly she left the room. The small boy knelt at his mother's bedside, his little face against hers. Softly he kissed the pale cheek. The boy's heart had become a man's. He tried by touch and look to speak his love, his sympathy, his admiration. His mother smiled at him as she soothed the baby, glad to be free from pain. But presently the shouted order of the departing townspeople reached her ears. She stirred uneasily. Fear crept into her eyes. Passionately she strained her little one to her. "'How soon, little son, how soon!' The lad, absorbed in his mother, had forgotten the Germans. With a start he realized the danger. His newborn manhood took command. His father was at the front. He must protect his mother and tiny sister." His mother was too ill to move, but they ought to get away. Who had a wagon? He hurried to the window, but already even the stragglers were far down the road. All but three of the horses had been sent to the front. Those three were now out of sight with their overloaded wagons. The boy stood stupefied and helpless. The woman on the bed stirred. My son, she called. My son. He went to her. 
You must leave me and go on. I can't, mother. The woman drew the boy down beside her. She knew the struggle to come. How could she make him understand that his life and the baby's meant more to her than her own? Lovingly she stroked the soft cheek. It was a grave, determined little face with very steady eyes. Son, dear, think of little sister. The Germans won't bother with babies. There isn't any milk. Mother hasn't any for her. You must take the baby in your strong little arms and run, run with her right out of this land into Holland. But he could not be persuaded. The mother understood that love and a sense of duty held him. She gathered the baby in her arms and tried to rise, but the overtaxed heart failed and she fell back half fainting. The boy brought water and bathed her head until the tired eyes opened. Little son, it will kill mother if you don't go. The boy's shoulders shook. He knelt by the bed. A sob broke from him. Then there came the faint, far-distant call of the bugle. Frantically, the mother gathered up her baby and held it out to the boy. For mother's sake, son, for mother! In a flash, the boy understood. His mother had risked her life for the tiny sister. She wanted the baby saved more than anything else in the world. He dashed the tears from his eyes. He wound his arms about his mother in a long, passionate embrace. I'll take her, mother. I'll get her there safely. The bugle grew louder. Through the open window on the far distant road could be seen a cloud of dust. There was not a moment to lose. Stooping, the boy caught up the red squirming baby. Very tenderly he placed the little body against his breast and buttoned his coat over his burden. The sound of marching feet could now be heard. Swiftly he ran to the door. As he reached the threshold, he turned. His mother, her eyes shining with love and hope, was waving a last goodbye. Down the stairs, out the back door, and across the field sped the child. Over grass and across streams flew the shore little feet. His heart tugged fiercely to go back, but that look on his mother's face sustained him. He knew the road to Holland. It was straight to the north, but he kept to the fields. He didn't want the baby discovered. Mile after mile... Through hour after hour he pushed on until twilight came. He found a little spring and drank thirstily. Then he moistened the baby's mouth. The little creature was very good. Occasionally she uttered a feeble cry, but most of the time she slept. The boy was intensely weary. His feet ached. He sat down under a great tree and leaned against it. Was it right to keep a baby out all night? Ought he to go to some farmhouse? If he did, would the people take baby away? His mother had said, run straight to Holland, but Holland was twenty miles away. He opened his coat and looked at the tiny creature. She slept peacefully. The night was very warm. He decided to remain where he was. It had grown dark. The trees and bushes loomed big. His heart beat quickly. He was glad of the warm, soft, live little creature in his arms. He had come on this journey for his mother. But suddenly his boy's heart opened to the tiny clinging thing at his breast, his little hand stroked the baby tenderly. Then he stooped, and softly his lips touched the red wrinkled face. Presently his little body relaxed, and he slept. He had walked eight miles. Through the long night, the deep sleep of exhaustion held him. He lay quite motionless, head and shoulders resting against the tree trunk, and the newborn babe, enveloped in the warmth of his body and arms, slept also. The feeble cry of the child woke him. The sun was coming over the horizon, and the air was alive with the twitter of birds. At first he thought he was at home, and had awakened to a long, happy summer's day. Then the fretful little cries brought back memory with a rush. His newborn love flooded him. Tenderly he laid the little sister down. Stretching his stiff and aching body, he hurried for water. Very carefully he put a few drops in the little mouth, and wet the baby's lips with his little brown finger. This proved soothing, and the cries ceased. The tug of the baby's lips on his finger clutched his heart. The helpless little thing was hungry, and he too was desperately hungry. What should he do? His mother had spoken of milk. He must get milk. Again he gathered up his burden and buttoned his coat. From the rising ground on which he stood, he could see a farmhouse with smoke issuing from its chimney. He hurried down to the friendly open door. A kindly woman gave him food. She recognized him as a little refugee bound for Holland. He had some difficulty in concealing the baby, but fortunately she did not cry. 
The woman saw that he carried something, but when he asked for milk, she concluded he had a pet kitten. He accepted this explanation. Eagerly he took the coveted milk and started on. But day-old babies do not know how to drink. When he dropped milk into the baby's mouth, she choked and sputtered. He had to be content with moistening her mouth and giving her a milk-soaked finger. Refreshed by sleep and food, the boy set off briskly. Holland did not now seem so far off. If only his mother were safe, had the Germans been good to her? These thoughts pursued and tormented him. As before, he kept off the beaten track, making his way through open meadows and patches of trees. But as the day advanced, the heat grew intense. His feet ached, his arms ached, and worst of all, the baby cried fretfully. At noon he came to a little brook sheltered by trees. He sat down on the bank and dangled his swollen feet in the cool, fresh stream. But his tiny sister still cried. Suddenly a thought came to him. Placing the baby on his knees, he undid the towel that enveloped her. There had been no time for clothes. Then he dipped a dirty pocket handkerchief in the brook and gently sponged the hot, restless little body. Very tenderly he washed the little arms and legs. That successfully accomplished, he turned the tiny creature and bathed the small back. Evidently this was the proper treatment, for the baby grew quiet. His heart swelled with pride. Reverently he wrapped the towel around the naked little one and, administering a few drops of milk, again went on. All through that long, hot afternoon he toiled. His footsteps grew slower and slower. He covered diminishing distances. Frequently he stopped to rest, and now the baby had begun again to cry fitfully. At one time his strength failed. Then he placed the baby under a tree, and rising on his knees uttered a prayer. Oh God, she's such a little thing. Help me to get her there. Like a benediction came the cool breeze of the sunset hour, bringing renewed strength. In the afternoon of the following day, a wagon stopped before a Belgian refugee camp in Holland. Slowly and stiffly a small boy slid to the ground. He had been picked up just over the border by a friendly farmer and driven to camp. He was dirty, bedraggled, and footsore. Very kindly the ladies' committee received him. He was placed at table, and a bowl of hot soup was set before him. He ate awkwardly with his left hand. His right hand held something beneath his coat, which he never for a moment forgot. The women tried to get his story, but he remained strangely silent. His eyes wandered over the room and back to their faces. He seemed to be testing them. Not for an hour, not until there was a faint stirring in his coat, did he disclose his burden. Then, going to her, whom he had chosen as most to be trusted, he opened his jacket. In a dirty towel lay a naked, miserably thin, three-days-old baby. Mutely holding out the forlorn object, the boy begged help. Bit by bit they got his story. Hurriedly, a Belgian refugee mother was sent for. She was told what had happened, and she took the baby to her breast. Jealously, the boy stood guard while his tiny sister had her first real meal— but the spark of life was very low. For two days the camp concentrated its attention on the tiny creature. The boy never left his sister's side, but her ordeal had been too great. It was only a feeble flicker of life at best, and during the third night the little flame went out. The boy was utterly crushed. He had now but one thought to reach his mother. It was impossible to keep the news from him longer. He would have gone in search. Gently he was told of the skirmish that had destroyed the Belgian hamlet. There were no houses or people in the town that had once been his home. "'That is his story,' ended the friendly little Dutch woman. "'And his father?' I inquired. "'Killed at the front,' was the reply. I rose to go, but I could not get the boy out of my mind. What a world! What intolerable suffering! Was there no way out?' Then the ever-recurring phrase of the French and Belgian soldiers came to me. When I had shuddered at ghastly wounds, at death, at innumerable white crosses on a bloody battlefield, invariably in dry, cynical, hopeless tones, the soldier would make one comment. C'est la guerre. Que voulez-vous? End of story. Biographical and interpretive notes by Charles Swain Thomas. Madeline Z. Doty of New York learned the true story of Little Brother when at The Hague in the summer of 1915 as a delegate to the Women's International Congress. Miss Doty is a lawyer by profession, 
by practice a writer, investigator, and traveler. With terrible concreteness, Little Brother weights our soul sense with the horror and tragedy of war. The story is told with bared realism, which the poignancy of the occasion freely extenuates. In short, crisp sentences, the opening scene is exposed. There follow in dizzying succession, and in the same quick, breathing style, the little tragic ordeals that fill the story with a terrible passion. It penetrates the very essence of our being, and starkly confronts us with the bleak mystery of the existing condition of world carnage, a carnage that wantonly wreaks its unselected vengeance on little sufferers, unskilled and unschooled in squaring their strength to ill-proportioned trials. End of section. Section 15 of Atlantic Narratives Modern Short Stories Published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org What Road Goeth He? by F. J. Laurit a smoky lantern, suspended from the roof by a piece of spun yarn, described intricate curves in the obscurity of the forecastle. Black chasms gaped on every side. Oilskins and sodden clothing slapped against the walls. The air was impure, saturated with moisture, and vibrant with the muffled roar of the storm outside. A thin sheet of water washed over the floor as the ship rolled. A sea chest broke from its lashings and carried away to leeward. The deck rose and the chest slipped aft. Amid a raffle of wet boots and sou'westers, it sank, and the heavy chest shot forward across the slippery floor to fetch up sharply against one of the bunks. Again the ship rolled and the chest glided to leeward. Mutterings came from the chasms, and pale faces distorted with yawns appeared above the bunk boards. The owner of the chest awoke and crept stiffly from his bunk. The ship rolled, the water splashed about his feet, and the chest swooped toward him. He made it fast and climbed into his bunk again without drying his feet. The faces had disappeared. The ship rose and fell. The lantern swung. The hanging clothes bulged and flattened and bulged again. Gloomy shadows wavered and seemed ever threatening to advance from the walls. The sound of the storm outside was dull and persistent. Boom! A solemn stroke of the bell on the forecastle head woke one of the sleepers. He sat up, expectant for a moment, and then sank back. As he did so, the door slid open. The storm bellowed as a man stepped through and was deadened again as he forced the door to behind him. He vanished into the starboard forecastle and reappeared with a short pipe that gurgled as he smoked. He seated himself on a chest, and the man who had awakened looked down on him. What time is it? he asked. The smoker looked up. That you, Bill? It's gone six bells. The other grumbled. I heard one bell from the forecastle head. She rolled bad just now, told the bell herself. <laughs> said the man in the bunk thoughtfully. Shut up, called a voice. I want to sleep. Bill lowered his voice. How's the weather? he inquired, looking down anxiously at the smoker's glistening oilskins. Heavy. The old man hain't left the deck for a minute. After that the man in the bunk could not sleep again. He heard the other leave the forecastle and swear as the flying spray struck his face. He heard a great body of water come over the bows and wash aft. He heard the heavy breathing about him. He lay in his clothing. It was wet, and his blankets were wet, warm wet anyhow, he thought, and shivered at the sound of the water washing about in the darkness below him, and at the thought of the weather outside. He counted the minutes grudgingly and lay dreading the sound of the opening door. Wide-eyed he watched the lantern swinging in the gloom, the pendulous clothing on the wall, the starting shadows, until someone beat frantically on the door and, staggering into the forecastle, turned up the light and called the watch. All hands, eight bells there, 
Do you hear the news, you port watch? Eight bells there. Men stirred and yawned. Tired men kicked off blankets and sat up swearing. Cramped men eased themselves from their bunks and pulled on sodden boots. They stumbled about the heaving deck, cursing their cold oilskins, cursing the ship, cursing the sea. Come, shake a leg, bullies, continued the inexorable voice. Weather bad and going to be worse. Get a move on you or the mate'll be forward with a belaying pin. Anything up? inquired one. Heard the old man tell the mate to take in the fore lower topsail. Thereupon they fell anew to cursing the captain, his seamanship, and above all his want of knowledge of the weather. The watch went out into the tumult of the night, out into a chaos of smashing seas and howling wind, out into a furious abyss of darkness and uproar. They collided blindly with other men. They called out angrily. Great seas crashed over the bulwarks and smothered them. Invisible torrents poured off the forecastle head and washed aft, beating them down, stunning them. From somewhere out of the darkness came the voice of the mate, bawling orders. They felt for the clue lines, making the most of the intervals between the boarding seas. High above them they knew a man was making his way aloft, in the darkness, to ease up the chain sheets. They hauled and swore, arching their backs against the seas that tore at their gripping fingers and washed their feet from under them. And always the mate's voice sounded cheerful, threatening, dauntless. Then up into the black night, rat line by rat line, panting, clutching, and climbing, out upon the invisible yard, along invisible foot ropes, grasping invisible jack stays, swaying in the darkness, spat upon by the storm, beating the stiff canvas with bleeding hands, unheeding the tumult of the sea, the pounding wind the lurching yard with no thought save for the mate's voice below and the lashing canvas under their hands from the foretop as they descended they looked far down on the narrow hull rolling pitching and shivering beneath them out from the darkness pale seas rushed roaring toward the ship and roaring passed to leeward seething masses of water rose over the bows smashed down on the deck and surged aft forward and over the side hissing foam creamed above the lee chains vicious rain squalls drove across the flooded decks the cold was penetrating in the empty forecastle the lantern swung the shadows rose and crouched the voice of the storm sounded deep and steady Ends of blankets dangled from the deserted bunks and flicked at the murmuring water on the floor. The deck soared and swooped, soared and swooped, minute after minute, hour after hour, and still the lantern swung and the shadows moved and waited. The door slid back. The storm bellowed, and three men staggered into the forecastle, bearing another. They laid him awkwardly in one of the lower bunks and stood for a moment looking down at him the ship rolled and the shadows on the wall started as if they too would gather around that gloomy berth again the deck dropped the shadows retreated and the three men turned and left the forecastle the man in the bunk lay inert as they had left him his body sagged lumpishly to the roll of the ship a dark stain appeared and spread slowly on the thin pillow a little later another man entered he came to the edge of the bunk and gazed for a few minutes then deliberately removed his dripping oilskin coat and sou'wester the man in the bunk began to moan and the other leaned over him the moans continued and the watcher sat down on a chest beside the bunk soon the sufferer's eyes opened and he spoke what time is it he asked lie quiet bill the other cautioned it's gone six bells my head hurts complained bill he tried to raise it and moaned a little the elder man placed a hand gently on his shoulder don't you worry he said you got hurt it a little when the spar carried away that's all spar repeated bill and pondered what watch is it middle watch i thought i'd been on deck said bill it was blowin 
His hands were groping about. Who bandaged my head? The steward. They carried ye down into the cabin first. Want a drink, Bill? Bill assented and the other bracing himself against the chest lifted the injured man's head slightly and he drank i may as well go to sleep he said and closed his eyes instantly he reopened them why ain't you on deck jansen he asked the old man sent me in to sit by you jansen fingered his long gray beard and the bright eyes under the shaggy brows blinked uneasily you see it's this way bill you was hurt and the old man thought maybe you'd want something he looked at the swinging lantern as if seeking inspiration anything i can do for ye bill he asked at last the other stirred i can't move me legs he complained maybe the spar hurt your back a little suggested jansen timidly you remember don't ye bill again the injured man pondered me back's broke he said finally and jansen nodded me back's broke and me head's broke bill went on and there's a pain in me side like dago knives do you want another drink asked jansen it's eight bells and my watch below for me said bill and again jansen nodded silence fell the muffled roar of the storm the plunging forecastle the waiting man on the chest the dim light the swinging lantern the pendulous clothing and the shadows all seemed accessory to the great event about to take place the pain in me side is awful groaned bill and jansen shivered the old man said he'd come forward as soon as he could leave the poop he said as if hoping there might be comfort in the thought i don't need him gasped the sufferer i'm going i think old jansen folded his hands and repeated the lord's prayer and then he leaned forward is is there anybody ashore you'd want me to write to he asked no answered bill between his moans me mother's dead and there's nobody else that matters i never was no good to any of em after a time the moans ceased a great sea boomed on the deck outside and washed aft the lantern swung violently and the ship's bell tolled jansen looked into the bunk bill's eyes were fixed on him i want to ask you jansen he said in a low voice do ye think there is any chance for me the other hesitated i i'm afraid not he stammered i don't mean a chance to live explained bill i mean do ye think i've got to go to hell jansen's tone grew positive no he said i don't I wished there was a parson here muttered the man in the bunk there used to be a old chap that came regular to the sailors home gray whiskers he had and a long coat I wished he was here he'd tell me the man on the chest listened his elbows on his knees his head on his hands I shook hands with him many a time continued bill he'd tell me Jansen started and looked up his bright deep-set eyes had taken on a look intent glowing shall i read to ye a bit he asked i've got a book it might strike ye now all right said bill indifferently the old man crossed the forecastle opened his chest and delving deep into its contents brought forth a small thin book it had seen much usage the binding was broken the leaves were stained and torn the old man handled it tenderly he held it high before him that the light from the swinging lantern might fall upon the text and read stumblingly pausing when the light swung too far from him and making grotesque blunders over some of the long words what is that book asked bill after a time it ain't the bible no said jansen it ain't the bible then who is it says them things demanded bill he talks like he was everything jansen lowered the book i don't exactly understand what they call him he answered they give him so many names but i reckon nobody but god talks like that whatever they call him where did you get it the book i mean persisted bill i was cleaning out a passenger's cabin two voyages back 
and I found it under the bunk. I've been reading it ever since. It's all full of strange foreign names, worse than the ones in the Bible. Well, neither of them stands to help me much, commented Bill. I ain't never been good. I've been a sailor man. That book, he broke off to groan as the ship rolled heavily, but resumed. That book says, same as the Bible, that a man's got to be pious and do good and have faith and all that, else he don't have no show at all. Listen, said Jansen. He turned the pages and read a few lines as impressively as he could. That sounds easy, said Bill, but I ought to ha knowed about that before. It's no good desiring anything now. It's too late. He'd know I was doing it just to save my own skin. My soul, I mean. Bill, said Jansen, I'm going to ask you something. He closed the little book over one finger and leaned toward the bunk. Do you remember how you come to be herded this way? The spare spar that was lashed to starboard fetched loose, and I tried to stop it, answered Bill readily. I see it coming. Why did you try to stop it? Well, a big sea had just washed the old man down in the lee scuppers, and if the spar had struck him, it would have killed him. It's killed you, Bill, said Jansen. Didn't you think of that? Me? exclaimed Bill scornfully. Who's me? But why did you want to save his life? insisted Jansen. The ship would stand a likely chance in a blow like this without a skipper, wouldn't she? Then you thought, thought nothing. There was no time to think. I see the spark coming, and I says, Blazes, that'll kill the skipper, and I tried to stop it. You ain't sorry you did it? Sorry nothing. What's done's done. See here, Bill, said old Jansen earnestly. I'll tell you what you did. You did your duty, and you laid down your life for another. You saved the captain's life, and maybe the ship, and all our lives through him. And you did it without thought or reward. Don't you suppose you'll get a little credit for that? I'm thinking, said Bill. He lay silent for a minute. Read that again, he requested. Old Jansen did so, and after a pause he added, Now if I was you, I wouldn't worry no more about hell. Just make your mind as easy as you can. That's a better way to go. I've got that, said Bill. It's all right. Go on, read to me some more. Jansen lifted the book and resumed his reading. He turned the pages frequently, choosing passages with which he was familiar. The other moaned at intervals. With every roll of the ship, water plashed faintly underneath the bunks. The lantern swung unwearied, and sodden clothing slapped against the walls. Dark shadows rose and stooped and rose again, as if longing and afraid to peer into the narrow berth. The sound of the storm outside was grave and insistent. The reader came to the end of a passage and laid the book on his knee. Suddenly he realized that the moans had ceased. He leaned over and looked at the man in the bunk. He was dead. Old Jansen sat motionless, deep in thought. At length he reopened the little book and read once more the lines which he had already repeated at the dying man's request. He is not lost, thou son of Pretha, no, nor earth nor heaven is forfeit even for him, because no heart that holds one right desire treadeth the road of loss. He closed the book and again meditated. Later he rose, replaced the book in his chest, drew the dead man's blanket over his face, and went out on deck. End of story. Biographical and Interpretive Notes by Charles Swain Thomas What Road Goeth He? F. J. Laurit is a pseudonym representing the dual authorship of Captain and Mrs. F. J. Green, long of Australia and now of Honolulu. By the free but not too lavish use of sea terms and common sailor talk, we are brought into immediate and intimate knowledge of the affairs of a ship floundering in a storm. Through graphic sensory images with their vivid and varied appeals, the whole perilous situation is wonderfully intensified. Seldom indeed are details better masked 
to secure an intended effect but the interest later comes to center in the great theme of sacrifice a sacrifice all the more significant because it is performed with such absolute spontaneity the story is a noteworthy example of strong effect secured with great economy of time and material end of section 15Section 16 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Clearer Sight, by Ernest Starr. Noakes leaned over a stand in one of the Maxineff laboratories and looked intently into a crucible while he advanced the lever of a control switch regulating the furnace beneath it. He held a steady hand on the lever, so that he might push it back instantly if he saw in the crucible too sudden a transformation. As he watched, the dull saffron powder took on a deeper hue about the edge, the body of it remaining unchanged. For several minutes he peered with keen intentness at the evil, inert little mass. No further change appeared. He leaned closer over it, regardless of the thin, choking haze that spread about his face. In his attitude there was a rigidity of controlled excitement out of keeping with the seeming harmlessness of the experiment. He was as a man attuned to a tremendous hazard, anticipation and mental endurance taught, all his force focused on one throbbing desire. He bent closer, and the hand on the lever trembled in nervous premonition. The deepened hue touched only the edge following regularly the contour of the vessel. It made no advance toward the center of the substance. It shall, Noakes breathed, and as if conning an oft-repeated formula, he said, the entire mass should deepen in color, regularly and evenly. Heat! Heat! His glance shifted to the control switch under his hand, its metal knobs, marking the degrees of intensity of the current it controlled, caught the light and blinked like so many small, baleful eyes particularly one, that which would be capped next in the orbit of the lever, held him fascinated. The winking potentiality of it thralled him, as the troubled crystal devours the gaze of the Hindu magi. He jerked back his head decisively. He would increase the current. The thought burned before him like a live thing, and in the light of it he saw many pictures, heliographs of happenings in and about the laboratories, flame, smoke dense and turgid, splintered wood, metal hurtling through air, bleeding hands, lacerated breasts, sightless eyes. That's the trouble with high explosives, he half groaned. He turned away from the stand and went to the single window that lit the room. Through it he saw shops, storehouses, and small buildings similar to his own, all a part of the plant of Maxineff. He thought of each small laboratory as a potential inferno, each experimenter a bondman to ecstasy, the whole frenzied, gasping scheme a furtherance of the fame and power of Henry Maxineff, already world-known, inventor of the deadliest high explosives. One of the buildings had been turned into a temporary hospital. He thought of the pitiful occupant, his face scarred, one socket eyeless, and shivered. "'It isn't that I want to hedge,' he said. "'I shall take the chance, but having risked everything, I will go to her able and whole.' offering it all without an apology. His gaze was drawn back to the crucible. In the thin haze above it, a face seemed to shine. Avidly he gave himself to the spell his tight-strung imagination had conjured, a face oval and delicately tinted, lips joyously curved, gray eyes not large, but brimming with enthusiasm, fearlessness, and truth, a white brow beneath simply arranged light hair. Let me bring with an avowal all that you have now, more, for in your life there can't be anything bigger than my love, and it's that which makes the deal right. Don't judge me yet. Wait until I've finished, and grant me that it's worth while, he whispered to the face, and his breath made little swirls and eddies in the haze about it. The filmy curves wafted toward him, bringing it close to his lips. The lids fluttered. Then an acrid odor filled his throat and nostrils. The face vanished. He started back, distraught. A rushing recollection of Maxineff's tragedies came to him, more vivid even than the face, 
Halsey, who jarred the nitro, had been annihilated. Yule was mad from the violent termination of an experiment similar to that now in development. A year ago, Noakes said, and still Yule lives and raves. How alike the cases were! The difference lay in the crucible. If the mixture there were properly prepared, added heat would metamorphose it calmly from its present harmlessness into something new, wonderful, deadly. It would become imbued with marvelous possibility, a thing for which royal military bureaus, imperial navies, would pay a great price. A twist of the lever would do it. Yet how alike! And Ewell was mad, injured gruesomely, living dead. Again the blinking switch caught him, but he shrugged away its evil suggestiveness. He sought to flee the strain of the moment, to make it seem natural and like the smaller risks of his daily occupation. He assumed a tottering bravado, and as he put his hand to the lever, he smiled crookedly. A light quick tread sounded on the walk outside, on the double step. As the knob turned, a voice said, "'May I come in, Mr. Alchemist?' His hand left the lever as if it pricked him. "'You! Am I a wraith?' Noakes looked at her silently. In the moment's abstraction, her presence seemed a manifestation of some psychic conduction which he tried lamely to understand. Here, now, in a moment of danger of which she unknowingly was the moving force. "'Then exercise me quickly. But don't sprinkle me with acid. It would be fatal to my clothes.' Noakes warmed to the aura of light and cheer about her. "'There isn't an alkali in the shop. I won't endanger you,' he replied easily. She moved into the room and paused a moment near the stand. "'Mrs. Max says you are confining yourself too closely. I've been with her all morning.' While she spoke, she took off her hat and smoothed her hair. "'I'm blown to pieces. I drove Cornish this morning. He got by everything on the way.' He acted like a premier danseuse when I passed the cooper's shop. His joy at seeing her was discountenanced by his fear for her, and he was afraid of her. Her insinuated trust in him threw into murky relief the affair which occupied him. When she turned to him a flushed, joyful face, and gray eyes clear and unsullied, it flashed into his soul, as formidly as a meany tekel, that she would unhesitatingly brush out of her life-path the dust of doubt, that equivocation and willingness to balance motives were no part of her. He knew that in her were no dim angles of cross-grained purpose, no shadowy intersections of the lines of good and evil. "'I say I'm blown to wisps. Couldn't you find me a mirror, please? What would I do with a mirror here? But see—' He lifted the window-sash, pulled in one shutter, and with a gesture of presentation said, "'As others see us.' She turned her back while she arranged her hair before the makeshift mirror. Relieved from her direct gaze, he stepped quickly to the stand and looked into the crucible. There was no change. He had expected none, but he could not be sure. Maxineff himself could not be sure of this new mixture. A run of the same temperature might bring about the change he looked for as readily as an increase. The suspense was unbearable. "'Well, Cagliostro, she called, "'you alchemists are capable of the utterest abstraction, aren't you? "'Why have you come?' he said quickly, frowning at her. "'To take you driving,' with an enticing smile. "'Will you not go? Please, at once?' "'Her manner lost something of its verve. "'It isn't safe, you know, really,' he added. "'And won't you come?' "'I cannot. Not this morning.' "'Well,' she said with a little sigh, as she thrust in her hat-pins. Mrs. Max will be disappointed. On her command I came to break up this seclusion of yours. None of us has seen you for a week, seven days. What are you doing? Oh, I've been working out some ideas. But you are so quiet about it. What are the ideas? Noakes hesitated, and she laughed merrily as she went toward the door. We laity are hopeless, aren't we? You are thinking that I couldn't possibly understand— no, I wasn't, because I scarcely understand myself. Of course, some secret formula Mr. Max has you on. Indeed, no, he said. Mr. Max knows nothing about it. That is, he continued hurriedly, it's the sort of thing— At any rate, I'll soon be through. She stood in the doorway, outlined against the bright incoming midday light, her face turned back to him. And then you will come out into the world again? Mrs. Max and Cornish and I shall be honored. Then I shall be free. He spoke the words with singular feeling. 
"'Truly, though, Mr. Noakes,' she said in a straightforward manner, "'you are too busy. Mrs. Max says you are to break out, break out with the measles if nothing else will interrupt you, and you are to have tea with her this afternoon.' Noakes looked doubtful. She went down the steps and turned again. "'Oh, I almost forgot. Here's a letter for you.' "'Where?' "'It came in the Maxineff's mail this morning. Mrs. Max suggested my bringing it to you.' Noakes took the long, foreign-stamped envelope. The typed superscription was non-committal, but at the Berlin postmark his eyes narrowed and the knuckles of the hand by his side whitened. He drew a quick breath and looked keenly at the girl. "'Was Mr. Maxineff at home this morning?' he asked quietly. "'No, I believe he's in the city.' "'Oh,' he breathed. "'Thank you very much.' He slipped the letter into his pocket. "'Well, I can't stay any longer,' Noakes pressed her hand. "'And Cagliostro, when the puzzle's solved, come to see me. I'll sing away the worries. Good-bye. Good-bye, Miss Becky. Excuse my untractableness, won't you?' With a pat to her hat and a smile to Noakes, she was gone. He watched her a moment, then strode rapidly to the stand. Looking through the faint haze, he saw her pass down the straight path which led to the great gate of the Maxineff workyard. When she was close to it, he grasped the switch lever with cramped fingers. His face was colorless. He moved the lever forward with a jerk, and lifting his eyes, saw her pass out of the gate. Beyond reach of time he waited. Evenly, insistently, a dull brown suffused the mass. Still he waited, fearfully wondering at the stability of this new thing. It kept its even coloring. He pushed back the lever, watched again, and waited. He was afire with joy. He had succeeded. He had created a thing new to the world, an explosive which would be more powerful than the deadliest in existence. He had perfected the work of a week's exquisite danger. He had won. I am glad, glad, he said faintly. As he straightened up, he found himself suddenly weak. The strain had been galling, and the madness of gratification consumed his strength. He moved toward the door, stepping very gently, for he knew not how slight a vibration might shatter the delicate affinity in his discovery. He remembered the foreign letter, and taking it from his pocket, tore open the envelope. He looked through the open door, conscious for the first time of the perfectness of the day. It was good to be alive, he thought, free, something accomplished, with leave to tell a girl. A tall man entered the gate and took the walk toward the laboratory. Noakes looked at him in a moment of amazement, almost of stupefaction. The necessity of instant action startled him to movement. As quickly as he thought, he pushed the door three-quarters shut, replaced the jars from which he had taken his materials, filled a second crucible with a harmless haphazard mixture, and placed it over a dead furnace in a stand in the corner behind the door. He lifted the window sash. With all his strength he hurled his priceless crucible. By a marvel of speed he had the sash lowered and was behind the door when the building was shaken by an explosion. "'What is that, Mr. Noakes?' came in deep, calm tones from the door. "'Good morning, Mr. Maxineff,' said Noakes, turning slowly. "'The racket? Some half-baked fulminate I put in the ditch out there an hour ago.' "'So long since?' said the older man, advancing toward the window. "'Yes, sir. I think the jarring of the wagon you see leaving the chemical house caused it.' A hole several feet in diameter marked the spot where the crucible fell. The stuff had delayed not an instant in working its havoc. Noakes was glad there was too little of it to cause a suspicious deal of damage. Maxineff looked reflectively about the yard, while Noakes nervously eyed his chief's expressive profile. His eyes wandered to the fine gray head of this tall, straight man. He could not fail to be impressed afresh by the forceful exterior, significant of the inner attitude which had won for Henry Maxineff a name honored among nations. "'What of your work?' he said. Noakes was glad those seeing eyes were not on him. "'I'm beat,' he said. "'I've gone at it every way I know, and I have been consistently and finally unsuccessful.' In the ensuing pause, Noakes realized that this was the first admission of failure he had ever made to his chief. The surprise it called forth was grateful to him. "'What's the trouble? But I think the trouble with you is that you have overreached yourself, Noakes.' "'Oh, no. The idea is a fine, tremendous one. Sheer stupidity is my trouble, I think.' His humility seemed real, and perhaps the unusualness of it brought a curious expression to Maxineff's face, 
and into his eyes a contemplative light that Noakes did not care to meet. "'I met Miss Hellam as I entered,' Maxineff said carelessly. The remark may have meant much, or it may have had merely an intentional indication of the intimacy accorded Noakes above the other assistants in the laboratories. Yes, she came to tell me that Mrs. Max will permit me to have tea with her this afternoon. You are coming, I hope. Indeed, yes. I confess I am tired out. I gave up the experiment early this morning. I understood the fulminate was running low, and spent my morning blundering over making some. I couldn't do that even, familiar as I am with the process. Well, leave it all and come with me over the yard. I am inspecting this morning. Be my secretary for a while. Five o'clock had passed when they emerged upon the New England town's stolid main street. They walked beneath the venerable flanking trees toward the Maxineff Villa, which surmounted a wooded continuation of the street. In a high gray and white room they found Mrs. Maxineff. She touched a bell as she said in an odd manner of inflecting, "'But you are late!' Moving to one end of the spindle-legged sofa, she made place at her side for Maxineff, and motioned Noakes to a chair near them. "'Ah, I see it. You will be a second Max, all science, all absence, and a woman waiting at home. Immolation, you call it?' she continued, her hands moving quickly among the appurtenances of the tea-table. "'That is what you prefer, my young Mr. Noakes.' "'I am under orders, you know, Mrs. Max,' said Noakes, with a deferential inclination of the head toward Maxineff. A servant brought in buttered rusks, and served the men with tea. "'Orders! For orders do you permit circles about your eyes as dark as they themselves are? Then you are easily immolate.' Over his cup Maxineff smiled encouragement to his wife. "'You are practical, my friend. Confess now. There is a reason for your—your your application?' Noakes's attitude was uncompromising. He placed his cup on the table before he spoke. "'The reason you are thinking of, Mrs. Max, is not for a poor man.' Mrs. Maxineff lifted her shoulders and displayed her palms in a manner that marked her nationality. "'So, science has made your dark skin white. Love for this business of killing men has kept you hid a week.' "'Of saving men,' Maxineff corrected, while his wife smiled as at the recurrence of a customary witticism. "'And you gave the orders, Max.' You are to be blamed for this display of energy. Don't scold, dear. It will be a wonderful thing. A new explosive? she interrupted. Do you remember the day we motored from Stoneham? I first thought of it then. I have been too busy to work on it, so I turned the idea over to Noakes. And I have made application to a home for the feeble-minded, Mrs. Max, Noakes said. Mr. Max will never commission me again. I'll be with you tomorrow, and we shall see wherein is the difficulty. But, Max, another, now I see your scheme of universal peace quite puffed away. This will bring it nearer, Maxineff said enthusiastically. Mrs. Maxineff shrugged her shoulders as she walked toward the long windows. Stay to dinner, will you? she said to Noakes. Thanks, but I couldn't with propriety. I forgot to have luncheon today, and your tea has given me a keen anticipation for dinner. My zest would be embarrassing to you, and past my control. Besides, I shall take a half-mile walk tonight. "'Lucky Becky. Then come again soon. Max, dear,' she said, turning to her husband. "'I cannot hear that again. I shall be on the porch.' When she passed through the window, Noakes seated himself to listen to a new exposition of the subject which chiefly aroused Maxineff's interest and loosed his speech. Frequently he bent his head in acquiescence, and occasionally interjected a pertinent question under the guidance of his secondary mind. But his thoughts moved in a circle of smaller radius." What to him was a policy of world peace? He cared not a jot what scheme of universal pacification men dreamed over. Maxineff's argument was not new to him. When he gave it serious attention, he doubted its practicability. The older man's voice seemed far away, as it said, Each new explosive deals a blow at war. War! Noakes had heard the same thing when his chief concluded with the government an agreement which secured to it the exclusive use of his latest product. This new thing will make war too dreadful a course for the least humanitarian nation to pursue. That the variance of nations tends toward equilibrium is incontrovertible. Granted, then— Noakes was practical. He placed before himself a definite goal. He exerted every power to attain it, and used the means at his disposal. If he encompassed it, he put it to the use for which it was intended. He gave no thought to the extraneous influence it exerted on other phases upon which his life touched. He had made a great discovery. 
not a fortunate accident like that of the man who discovered nitro. With great danger to himself, he had followed a line of reasoning to its proximate end, the resulting discovery he would use to his individual advantage. He did not accord to himself the godlike privilege of casting discord among the nations, and he did not care what peaceful zoo the lion, the bear, and the various species of eagle found as common refuge. On the other hand, if to each is given coextensive power, the voice slipped away as Noakes humorously wondered why Maxineff had never been a delegate to a peace conference. The great man's argument was advanced step by step. The light faded. Secure in the dusk, Noakes no longer maintained a semblance of attention. He weighed the chances of the present and actualized his long-time dreams. A servant clicked soft light from the wall and removed the tea table. Noakes rose, uttered a commonplace, and bade his chief good night. Soon he was descending the village street, keeping pace with his rapid thoughts. From the exchange he dispatched a messenger to the house a half-mile away. He dressed quickly, the while reading repeatedly his foreign letter. When dressed, he sat on the bed, chin in his palms, and looked at the blank bedroom wall. A frown hung between his brows. Later he sat before the shelves in his study, absently scanning the backs of the books. When, when, he said aloud. In the morning Maxineff would come to search for that which he had found. He might be there for weeks, from morning till night. In that case the work must be delayed and misguided. The proportions were finely calculated. The method could not be bettered. He could duplicate it in an hour. If only he could repeat the experiment before— Tonight, he said, and left the room with a firm step. He dined well, though with few words for the kindly lady in whose home he lived. He took the path by the side of the road which led in the opposite direction from the Maxineff place. He lit his first pipe since morning. How good life was! The town, the plant, Maxineff, were all behind him. Ahead was a goal toward which he bore with increasing lightness of heart. Clearly defined decisions, unregretted, faded into the brightness of anticipation. His pack of problems dropped from him. One day more and he could speak. One evening of companionable friendship. Her yard was a gnomish alternation of unsullied light and alluring shade. The moon utilized impartially natural and artificial features of landscape as detail for the picture of gray, black, and silver. Noakes traversed less rapidly the curved driveway, pausing where it was cut by a paved way to the door. Through a window he saw her seated on the piano bench, her head bent forward, her mellow-tinted hair coiled low. She was singing softly. She came to the door to meet him. "'Will duty call you back before you have been with me just a little while?' she asked as they entered the room. "'No, duty has lost her voice at present.' She dropped into a big armchair. He turned his back to the light and sat facing her. "'What have you been doing this week?' "'Singing, mostly.' "'Sing now, please.' "'No, let's talk first. "'Well, how did Cornish behave on your way back?' "'Quite as well as if you had been with us, Noakes.' He leaned forward quickly. "'Do you know that's the first time you've called me Noakes?' "'It slipped. Mrs. Max says it, you know. I am weak about taking on colloquialisms. "'And you are sorry you have been so easily influenced?' Noakes asked in ponderous aggrievement. "'You do not seem to be overjoyed.' "'I am,' he said gently. "'Don't be hilarious over it. "'I will. I wish. "'Well, certainly. Noakes it shall be. "'Thanks, Miss Beck. "'Haven't you done anything but work these days?' I have thought, more or less. Strange. What about? You, of course. Steady. Spring has passed. And tonight I heard a queer thing about you. What? she asked in an engaging manner of invitation to confidence. That you are to be married. I have it on the word of my landlady. I? So it is rumored in the village. I am glad my family is not so anxious to thrust me off as my friends are. You are unwilling to be thrust off, as you put it? Married? No, not unwilling, unprepared. It is so very final, you know. A woman gives up everything. Not necessarily. Oh, yes, she does. Freedom, family, associations. And in return? From the right man she gets a sort of compensation. Not a high valuation. A true one. She knows she cares more than he does. No, no. Noakes spoke from a full heart. She does and knowing it, she need not expect equal return, only part compensation. But how good he ought to be. Good? he asked doubtfully. Yes, everything she thinks he is, 
No man loved of woman is that. Noakes, you are disillusioning, and incorrect, and moreover, traitorous to your kind. Not a bit of it, you overpraise my kind. But let's be definite, you know he may be all, and may not always have been, in which connection he may not be expected to enlighten the dreaming lady, may he? I think he may. But he may possess a certain masculine trait, a kind of secretiveness. Secretive, she mused. Then he is a bit of a coward, I think. He would be a cad, Noakes said quickly, to tell her things that would pain her. Understanding will come sooner or later, she said oracularly. It is better to become accustomed to a thing than have it come as a revelation. I see, Noakes said, like taking a tonic in midwinter to fend off spring fever. You forget, he continued in a different tone, looking at her speculatively, that understanding may never come. Then he has put her on a lower intellectual plane. He is withheld from her as he might from a child. No, he has loved her too well to hurt her. Loved her so ill that he has deceived her from the beginning. To my mind there is something active in deception. This would be rather an omission. An omission that is an insult to her. Not at all, Noakes spoke somewhat vehemently. Don't think I mean, she said, that there should be a detailed interchange of trivial confidence. That would be tiresome. If, however, there were one big thing in his life that might influence her feeling toward him, he should tell it, and let her judge. Not smooth over a disagreeable occurrence? Never. It would be cruel. Noakes sat very still. If I were the girl, she began, and checked the speech with a faint laugh. But we will not be dramatic, nor personal. Noakes told himself he had always known that this was her thought. She was too clear-hearted to feel anything else. The understanding of which she had half-seriously spoken must never come, and the only means of avoiding it was tonight's silence, the silence of all the days to follow. He foresaw the revelation which might come, and realized that any abnegation was worthless except the sacrifice of his love. Alive, aware of its possible fulfillment, he could not condemn himself to the sacrifice. She had not asked it of him, and he would not face that which she might ask if he obeyed the weak voice which counseled a surrender to her judgment. To the last intoxicating drop he would drink, in reverent loving thankfulness for the draught vouchsafed him. He would care, not in fearful accumulation of credit against a day of reckoning, but in surrender to the brimming abundance of their store. He would secure to her freedom from that possible pain by following the inevitable trend. His regard was a compelling force with which he had lived and grown since he had known Becky. He had not spoken of it to her, silenced by the piteous bane of insufficient income. But now almost he was free. When he spoke, the breadth and depth of the thing it was would induce her assent. Of this he was so sure that he did not consider the possibility of refusal. His failure to anticipate such a chance was by no means due to an underestimation of her powers of will, determination, or selection rather to the feeling which, with the beat of his heart, knocked for freedom to go out, out about the world, and with its sweeping lines converged again, to enter and permeate a heart attuned to reception and response. He sat beside her on the piano bench, and placed before her the songs he liked best. Her voice was a pure soprano, of an expressive sweetness which affected Noakes as nothing else he had known. It seemed to him that her clarity of soul found expression in her exquisitely pure singing tones. With hands tight clasped between his knees, fearing to look at her, Noakes listened while she sang him into a half-visualized dream, as obsessing as it was imminent, which he clung to and enjoyed to the full in order that he might ignore the longing than to speak his thought. His dream keyed him to a responsiveness which made his throat throb in sympathy with the vibration of her tones. Presently, he went away. Alone in the silver-splotched yard, the spell yet held him, but when the white road pointed away back to what he had left behind, a fog of uncertainty encircled him, dissipating the glow of his dream, checking his anticipation, crushing his problem close to him in the narrow circle of his vision, so close that, although a thing solved and set aside, it loomed ominous and insistent. He followed the road back to what he had left behind. In the laboratory, Noakes bent over a crucible. The room was still. Not even the night sounds penetrated the shut door and closed window. The light from a single bulb played upon the set lines of his jaw, and upon the still hand which lay on the switch lever. He drew a deep breath that quivered through the room with startling distinctness. 
he bent closer to the tiny quantity of powder in the bottom of the vessel. Suddenly he stood erect and looked about him. His glance slowly circled the room, and fell to the hand on the switch lever. Then he advanced the lever. It came as a burst of light, taken up and radiated by clouds of fume and gas with which the air was instantly impregnated. Around Noakes was a white-hot brilliance which he could not face and could not escape. His eyes pained horribly. He heard a crescendo roaring as of a billow breaking on the shore. As suddenly as it had come, the light went out. He was in darkness. He trained his gaze into the void, and succeeded only in augmenting the pain back of his eyes. The darkness was impenetrable. He began to realize what had happened. With a low moan he crumpled and sank to the floor. Late in the afternoon of the next day, behind a livery horse, two men were covering the roadway between town and the Hellum place. To one the way seemed long. He leaned back wearily and pulled a soft hat down over his bandaged eyes. "'Where are we?' he asked. "'At the gate,' the driver replied. Noakes stiffened. The gate closed behind them, and the wheels rumbled on the driveway. "'Is—is is anyone in front?' "'Miss Hellum is on the porch, sir.' The vehicle came to a stop. "'Afternoon, Miss Beck,' Noakes called. He tried to make it sound pleasant and commonplace, and knew that he failed. Grasping the side of the vehicle, he descended clumsily. Becky took his hand and pressed it warmly. She turned and took a step toward the house, still holding his hand. He withdrew it. I don't, please. I know the way. With the shuffling tread of the blind, he ascended the walk, stopping uncertainly at the foot of the steps. He heard Becky, at his side, draw a quick breath as if about to speak. He half turned to her, and hearing nothing more, mounted the steps heavily. Do you know, he said, as he paused at the top, I've never counted these steps before. I didn't know there were so many. Let's sit inside, if you don't mind. He went a little way, and Becky put her hand on his arm. It's this way, Noakes, she said gently, as she guided him into the room in which they were the night before. Thank you. It's a bit hard to be led, Noakes said huskily. They sat on a deep couch. Noakes, was it wise to come? I'm glad you are here, but won't it hurt you, retard your recovery? Becky asked anxiously. I had to come. Mr. Max told me, both he and the doctor telephoned me early this morning, that in spite of all they said to you, you insisted on coming. I am fit, sound, except for my eyes. That's the shame of it, he said bitterly. They couldn't persuade me that I should rest now, rest to recover from a shock that will last a lifetime. I thought— I was afraid you might add fresh danger by coming out so soon. I tell you, I had to come, he said with level forceness. As for my eyes, the harm is done. Is it irremediable? I am blind. But soon, some day, surely. No, the doctor gives me banalities for answers. I suppose he thinks I would go to pieces if he told me the truth. Yes, perhaps he thinks you could not bear the truth, Becky assented very gently. Her low, feeling tones brought a lump to Noakes's throat. He felt the sympathy which quivered in her voice, and it nearly unmanned him, but he misunderstood her meaning. He thought that she felt with him the sting of being deprived of full knowledge of his condition, the hurt of their doubting his strength. That Becky meant something far different, he might have known from her humble acquiescence and the sudden touch of her hand on his arm. "'I've been trying to think it out,' Noakes said, his voice low at first, roughening and increasing in volume as he spoke. But here I am, unweakened in mind and body, and put aside, not to see, never to see for myself the beautiful things about me, shut out from everything, with power to do and ability to appreciate, yet put out in darkness, never to— Oh, Becky, you, I can't ever see you again. Don't, you mustn't, please. I didn't intend to speak so to you. I haven't the right— you must pardon me. He was silent a moment. I came to say something else. He turned his head about impatiently, calling upon his bandaged eyes to perform their function. Is it dark yet? he asked. We are in the gloaming, Becky answered softly. Noakes shut his lips, taking counsel of his powers of control before he spoke. Becky, he began, and gave a tired little sigh. Let me call you Becky today. Yes, she acquiesced quietly. Becky, he continued, lingering over the word, thinking of the privilege of its use as an accolade conferred by her 
You need not speak when I have finished. I'll go away then. What is it? Becky asked. Tell me. Noakes leaned forward, pressing his temples, then sat erect and turned his face toward her. I love you, he said. I think it has been through more lifetimes than this. I know I shall always love you. I could no more grow away from it than I could add a cubit to my stature by taking thought. I kept silent because I was poor. Don't think of this as a bit of sordidness creeping in. My love would not ask of you any sacrifice. I could not give you the things you are accustomed to, so I said nothing. I planned and worked for a time when I would be privileged to speak. He heard an inarticulate sound at his side and quickly continued. Last night I thought the time was close at hand. I thought in a few days I could come to you and ask you for your love. Success of a certain kind was about to crown an effort of a despicable kind. Of that I must tell you. Tonight I am confessing a wrong I have done you. That's what it is. Oh, Becky, the explosion last night took away my sight, made me a useless blind man, but it opened my eyes, too. It is as if a scroll were outspread before me, on which is a record of all my tendencies and crucial acts. I can see my failures at the crises of my life, and I can trace them back to causes, can see wherein a lightly taken determination has later borne bitter fruit. Last night I thought I had reached the pinnacle of attainment. In reality, I had fallen lower than ever before. The success which was to be the beginning of all good things was stolen. I robbed Maxineff of it. He gave me an idea to work out. I followed his instructions to a point where I knew a different treatment might bring about a fine result. I saw great possibilities in the experiment, and determined to keep for myself the benefits of it. From that point I followed my own ideas, and called the thing mine. I opened correspondence with the representatives of a foreign government. They agreed to buy the secret in case of a successful test. It was an excellent bargain I made. I put a high price on the betrayal of my benefactor. The experiment was successful. I was forced to destroy the result. Why, it is needless to say. Last night, when I left you, I went back to repeat the experiment, intending to make a small quantity to be used in the test which would have taken place tomorrow. Something went wrong with the unstable stuff. And you know the rest. In relief from the tension of his confession, his voice dropped lower as he said, Now you know me. He shifted his position, stretching out his hands toward her. He touched her face, started, and drew back. And Becky, do you realize that it was after I left you last night that I went back? After what you told me? Oh, Becky, I am glad I cannot see you now. His voice quivered off to a whisper. It is poor consolation that I know myself for what you judge me. I know bitterly well. I see much now. I could not come to the weakest agreement with the self I want to be, until I had told you of the wrong I have done you. And let me think my love is not distasteful to you. I know I am past your caring for, and I'll never ask it of you. But let me keep on loving you. Won't you, Becky? He paused and listened. He heard Becky's uneven breathing. I don't offer any excuse. There is none to offer. I want only the comparative peace of the assurance that those I have wronged understand now. I have talked with Mr. Maxineff. He was with me afterwards, when the pain... He hushed me far too gently, but he will not forget. You will not forget either, Becky. You will not excuse. If, though, you should ask me why, I would say again, I love you. It is the only reason. I was thinking of you while I was making myself unfit for you to think of me. Do you care so much? Becky asked softly. Yes, may I keep on caring? To what good? For the sake of the little good in me, which love of you will keep alive and growing. You ask nothing of me. What will you find in caring for me? There will be a constant joy in knowing that you permit me to care. Becky was silent. If you won't let me, I am afraid it will make no difference, because I cannot help it, you know. I don't want to help it. You don't mind my saying so? For a moment neither of them spoke. Noakes rose. I— Becky, I thank you for hearing me out. He went a step away from her. I'm going. She did not rise. I am glad that you have not spoken of my— my mistake, and somehow I am sorry. I know what you— How do you know what I think? I know. That's all. Don't go, please, Becky said. Hadn't I better— I'm tired, and the doctor, 
A last acknowledgment. I am afraid to hear you. But I don't want you to go, she said softly. Something in her tone made Noakes turn sharply. Becky! Yes, Noakes? You don't... Yes! You love me? And blind? You are brave! Her hands were in his when he sat by her side. I talked with a doctor this morning, she said. As I did. No, he gave me a message for you. A message from the doctor? It was Mr. Max's notion that I should tell you. What is it? Noakes asked quickly. Your eyes. They will be well in time, if you are very careful. As Noakes breathed deep in relief and gratitude, one of his hands engaged two of Becky's, and he found a different use for the other. Noakes, Becky said, I'll take care of the eyes. End of story. Biographical and interpretive notes by Charles Swain Thomas. Ernest Starr, a writer of occasional stories, lives in North Carolina. The most interesting element in Mr. Ernest Starr's narrative is the dramatic conflict of emotions. Placed first in the gnomish atmosphere of a chemical laboratory, the tone soon changes from scientific to ethical, each interest being intensified and directed by the deep emotion of romantic love. A serious accident in the laboratory creates the crisis. It reveals to Noakes, the young scientist, the inexcusable baseness in his character, a baseness which allowed him to act with direct disloyalty to his employer and with somewhat obvious disloyalty to the ideals cherished by the girl whom he loved. The situation is finally relieved by his confessions and by the physician's hope that the young scientist's physical blindness is not necessarily permanent. The author shows unusual skill in dialogue, in analysis, and in the handling of both conventional and dramatic situations. End of section. Section 17 of Atlantic Narratives Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Garden of Memories by C. A. Mercer Read by Lynn Thompson The garden looked dreary and desolate in spite of the afternoon sunshine. The lilac and lavender bushes were past their prime. Their wealth of sweetness had been squandered by riotous offshoots. The wind played among the branches and cast changing sun-flecked shadows on the grass-grown paths, narrowed by the encroachment of the box borders that had once lined the way with the stiff precision of troops before a royal progress. The flowers had the air of being overburdened with the monotony of their existence. They could never have had that aspect if they had been only wild flowers and had never experienced human care and companionship. That made the difference. The gate hung on rusty hinges. It answered with a long drawn out creaking as it was pushed open by a man who had been a stranger to the place for nearly twenty years. Yes, the garden was certainly smaller than it had been pictured by his memory. There had been a time when it had appeared as a domain of extensive proportions and the wood beyond of marvellous depth and density. He was conscious of a sense of disappointment. The property would scarcely realise as high a price in the market as he had hoped, and it was incumbent upon him to part with it if he would be released from the narrow circumstances that hemmed him in. He had arranged to meet the lawyer there that afternoon. One of the latter's clients had already made a bid for the estate. The timber, at all events, would add to the value. The house faced southward upon the garden. It was here the man had been brought up by an old great-aunt. He guessed later that she had grudged him any of the endearments that death had denied her bestowing upon her own children. Her affections had all been buried before he was born. Besides, he took after the wrong branch of the family. She must have possessed a strong personality. It was difficult to bring to mind that it was no longer an existent force. Everyone, from the parson to the servants, had stood a little in awe of her. 
He remembered the unmoved manner in which she had received the news of the death of a near relative. It had overwhelmed him with a sudden chill that so she would have received tidings of his own. It had taken all the sunshine in the garden to make him warm again. In the mood that was growing upon him, it would not have much surprised him to find her sitting bolt upright in her carved high-backed chair, as she had sat in the time of his earliest recollections, the thin yellow hands on which the ring stood out, folded in her lap. On one occasion she had washed his small hands between hers, the hard luster of the stones acquired a painful association with the ordeal. The blinds would be partially drawn in the musk-scented parlour to save the carpet from further fading, for there had been a tradition of thrift in the family from the time of its settlement, a tradition that had not been maintained by its latest representative. Like the atmosphere of a dream, the years grew dim and misty between now and the time when summer days were longer and sunnier, and it had been counted to him for righteousness, for he had amused himself quietly and not given trouble. A stream that he had once dignified with the name of river formed a boundary between the garden and the wood. Although it had shrunk into shallow insignificance, with much beside, a faint halo of the romance with which he had endued this early scene of his adventures still clung to the spot. As he came to the stream, he saw the reflection of a face in the water, not his own, but that of one much younger. It was so he met the boy. The child had been placing stepping stones to bridge the stream, and now came across, balancing himself on the slippery surfaces to test his work. It was odd that he had remained unobserved until this moment, but that was due to the fact of the water rushes on the brink being as tall as he. The boy's eyes met those of the man with a frank, unclouded gaze. He did not appear astonished. That was the way when one is young enough to be continually viewing fresh wonders. One takes everything for granted. He saw at a glance that this other was not alien to him. His instinct remained almost as true as those of the wild nature around. For his own part, he had an unmistakable air of possession about him. He appeared to belong to the place as much as the hollyhocks and honeysuckle, and yet, how could that be? Probably a child of the caretaker, the man told himself. He had authorized the agent to do what was best about keeping the house in order. He had not noticed what signs it had to show of habitation. Now he saw from the distance that it had not the unoccupied appearance he had expected of it nor the windows, the dark vacant stare of those that no life behind illumines. "'Do you live here?' he asked the boy. "'Yes.' The boy turned proudly toward the modest grey pile in the manner of introducing it, forgetting himself in his subject. "'It's a very old house. There's a picture over the bureau in the parlour of the man who built it and planted the trees in the wood. Hannah says... Hannah?' It was a foolish repetition of the name. Of course, there were other Hannahs in the world. The old servant of that name, who had told the man stories in his boyhood, had been dead more years than the child could remember. Yes, don't you know Hannah? She'll come and call me in presently, and then you'll see her. Hannah says they, the trees, have grown up with the family. He assumed a queer importance evidently in unconscious mimicry of the one who had repeated the tradition to him, and that with them the house will stand or fall. Do you think the roots really reach so far? There was an underlying uneasiness in the tone, which it was impossible altogether to disguise. As the other expressed his inability to volunteer an opinion on this point, the boy went on, seeing that his confidences were treated with due respect. I dug up one myself once, I wish I hadn't afterwards, to make myself a Christmas tree like I'd read about. I just had to hang some old things I had on it. It was only a tiny fir, small enough to go in a flower pot. But that night the house shook, and the windows rattled as if all the trees in the forest were trying to get in. I heard them tapping their boughs ever so angrily against the pane. As soon as it was light, I went out and planted the Christmas tree again. I hadn't meant to keep it out of the ground long. They might have known that. 
Have you no playfellows here? The boy gave a comprehensive glance around. There are the trees. They are good fellows. I wouldn't part with one of them. It's fine to hear them all clap their hands when we are all jolly together. There are nests in them, too, and squirrels. We see a lot of one another. This statement was not difficult to believe. The Holland overalls bore evident traces of fellowship with mossy trunks. The boy did most of the talking. He had more to tell of the founder of the family, whose portrait hung in the parlour, and of how, when he, the child, grew up, he rather thought of writing books, as that same ancestor had done, and making the name great and famous again. He had not decided what kind of books he should write yet. Was it very hard to find words to rhyme if one tried poetry? He was at no pains to hide such fancies and ambitions, of which his kind are generally too sensitive or too ashamed to speak to their elders, and which are, as a rule, forgotten as soon as outgrown. "'Shall we go in the wood now?' said the boy. "'It's easy enough to cross over the stepping-stones.' "'Yes, let us go.' The man was beginning to see everything through the boy's eyes. The garden was again much as he had remembered it, enclosed in a world of beautiful mystery. Nothing was really altered. What alteration he had imagined had merely been a transitory one in himself. The child had put a warm, eager hand into his. Together they went into the wood, as happy as a pair of truant schoolboys. They might have been friends of long standing. "'So this is your enchanted forest?' said the man. "'Not really enchanted,' replied the boy seriously. "'I once read of one, but of course it was only in a fairy tale. "'That one vanished as soon as one spoke the right word. "'It would be a very wrong word that could make this vanish.' "'He had a way of speaking of the wood as if it were some sacred grove. "'His companion suddenly felt guilty, not quite knowing why. "'Of course someone might cut them down.' The boy lowered his voice. It seemed shameful to mention the perpetration of such a deed aloud. It would be terrible to hear them groan when the axe struck them. The young ones mightn't mind so much, but it would be bad for the grandfather trees who've been here from the beginning. Hannah says one would still hear them wailing on stormy nights. Even if they had been felled and carted away? Yes, even then. Though to be sure... There would be no one to hear the wailing, if it's true that the house must fall, too, at the same time. But we needn't trouble about that. None of it is likely to happen. You see, if it did, where should I be? He laughed merrily. This last argument appeared to him to be quite conclusive. Such an important consideration placed the awful contingency quite out of the question, and transformed it into nothing more than a joke. The child's laughter died away as they both stood still to listen. Each thought he had heard his own name called. "'It's Hannah,' said the boy, and off he raced toward the house, barely saving himself from running into the arms of another person who had turned in at the gate. "'Who was the boy who ran round by the espaliers a minute ago? One would scarcely have judged him to be a child of the caretaker.' The man's heart sank with a dull thud. Something had told him the answer before it came. Child? The lawyer looked puzzled. I did not see one. No children have any business in this garden. Neither is there any caretaker here. The house has been shut up altogether since the old servant you called Hannah died eleven years ago. They had reached the veranda. The westering sun had faded off the windows. It was easy to see that the house was empty. The shutters were up within, and the panes dark and weather-stained. Birds had built their nests undisturbed in the chimney-stacks. The hearthstones had long been cold. "'My client is willing to purchase the property on the terms originally proposed,' the lawyer was saying. "'He contemplates investing in it as a building site. Of course, the timber would have to be felled.' A breeze passed through the treetops like a shudder. The younger man interposed. I am sorry you should have had the trouble of coming here, but I have decided to keep the old place after all, stick and stone. It is not right it should go out of the family. I must pull my affairs together as well as I can without that. The little phantom of his dead boyhood 
was to suffer no eviction. End of story. Biographical and interpretive notes by Charles Swain Thomas. C. A. Mercer is an American author who has, unfortunately, been altogether silent of late years. In this story, the traditions and influence of Hawthorne are picturesquely revived. The experience is one which is a bit fragile and tenuous, but to readers who reproduce in their fancy the more delicate picturings of their childhood, who delight in the recreation of mood, who frequently relive their childhood sentiments, to all such will come a sense of pleasure in this contemplation of the tracery here so artistically etched. End of section 17section 18 of atlantic narratives modern short stories published 1918 by the atlantic monthly press this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the clearest voice by margaret sherwood recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the little business frown which john wareham usually wore only at his office and put off as he put on his hat in starting for home lingered that evening persisting through the long street-car ride the walk past rows of suburban houses and even to the brook at the foot of the hill below his home here it vanished for the brook marked the spot where the world stopped and alice began he watched with a meditative happy smile the rough stone fence which bordered this bit of meadowland with the trailing woodbine and clematis that made it a thing of beauty and as he climbed the hill suddenly sitting upright suddenly sitting upright suddenly sitting upright of harmony breaking a mood of anxiety and fear then came the comforting glimpse of the red brick house through the encompassing green with its white daintiness of porch fan window and window facings it all looked like her in its serene and simple distinction it seemed to embody her her creative touch was everywhere the bay window about which they had disagreed when the house was planned had surprisingly turned out to the liking of both as he fumbled at the latch of the gate and pinched his finger as he always did a vexed sense of triumph came to him for it surely would have worked better if he had insisted on having his own way everywhere were traces of little worries and little triumphs the latter predominating it was the very soul of home from the threshold to the branches of the tall elm which touched the roof protectingly it was wholly desirable and it might have to go as he followed the brick walk in bitterness he closed his eyes that he might not see and so ran into a porch pillar the one on which alice's red roses were blossoming the queer little groan that he gave in some strange way took on the sound of railroads and again railroads as he beat his head against the pillar once or twice purposely and his voice had a note of contempt he had not felt that way about railroads when he had invested his savings partly in the stock of a new railroad in the west partly in the stock of an old railroad in the east that was doing wild things in the way of improvements then there had been nothing too good for him to say about the earning power of railroads the wise management of railroads the net profit of railroads now both railroads were in trouble dividends were cut and the stock which he had hoped to sell at a profit had dropped almost to zero the mortgage loan on his house was due in a month and he a man earning only a moderate salary in a real estate office had nothing in the world wherewith to meet the emergency even the savings bank deposit had gone into railroad stock in order that the mortgage might be paid off more quickly but his face lighted up with a smile both sad and bright which made quite a different phase of it as he crossed the threshold that threshold on which alice had stopped to kiss him the day he had married her and brought her home there was something here that shut out all the trouble in the universe 
about the doorway his wife's laughter seemed to be always floating that laughter merry touched with tenderness made up of mirth and sorrow as all wise laughter is just then came little jack to meet him speeding madly down the baluster and john as he picked up his boy kissed him and reproved him for coming downstairs that way had nothing to answer when his son averred that it was lots better than a railroad save that might well be there's ice cream for dinner the boy exploded and the father roughly smoothing jack's tousled hair started as he caught a sound of chatter from the living room and stood still in dismay that today of all days should be the time of a family gathering which brought two uncles two aunts and three cousins to the house how completely he had forgotten he hung up his hat and grasped little jack's hand he would tell them nothing about his troubles nothing he would be the ideal host concealing his personal vexations under a cordial smile but hardly had he opened the door with his office bag still held absent-mindedly in his hand when they were upon him the cordial smile did not deceive them for a minute aunt janet who was sitting by the fireplace looked the most troubled of all though she said nothing it was why john what's the matter from aunt mary and well john how goes it from uncle philip who looked as if he knew that it went very badly indeed and what makes you look so worried with a home like this no man ought to look worried from his cousin austin who had recently become engaged and was thinking about homes he nodded approvingly at the room which was simply furnished soft in coloring with english chintzes a few pictures of trees and of water all out-of-door things and a fireplace that showed signs of constant use john's face brightened as he caught this look of admiration not all the confusion of greetings and inquiries in regard to health not all the business worries in the world could check the sense of peace that always came to him in entering this room which more perfectly than any other spot expressed the personality of alice he managed to make his way through the little crowd of sympathetic wrinkled faces and wondering smooth faces there were it was discovered comfortable chairs enough for all and john found himself as host the center of the little group bent on probing his affairs in friendly fashion to the bottom it was his sister emily who finally started the flood of questioning that led to the betrayal of the secret he had meant to keep for the present she came bustling in through the door leading to the dining room looking anxious as soon as she glanced at her brother and from the brass bowl of yellow roses held unsteadily in her hand a few drops spattered on the floor are you ill john she asked or have you lost among all the many voices of inquiry comment question whereby she was interrupted the voice of alice was the clearest making the others no matter how near the speakers stood seem to come from far away little jack came and climbed upon his father's knee a curious reproduction of the family look of worry appearing on his chubby face john the elder leaned his head back in the chintz covered chair shutting his eyes for a minute with a sense of warmth and satisfaction and the nearness of the cuddling body of his son everything's the matter he said wearily everything and he had a momentary twinge of conscience realizing that he was not being the ideal host they all watched him anxiously sympathetically in silence and aunt mary near the window went on drawing her needle in and out with exquisite precision her gray head bent over the centerpiece which she intended to present to the house oh no i'm not ill said john wareham suddenly sitting upright but the long gorge railroad has gone into a receiver's hands and three days ago the new york and nineveh cut its dividend I'm done for Emily gave a little gasp and said nothing you'll pull through all right asserted uncle Philip stirring up the fire in order to hide his face and cousin Austin slapped John's shoulder saying facetiously take courage Jeremiah the worst is yet to come John laughed in spite of himself and struck his fist upon the knee not occupied by Jack every dollar i had in the world i had drawn out and put into these two cursed things now i've nothing no capital no credit the place has got to go
no, no! cried the women folk. the place has got to go, repeated jack wareham, his face in little jack's hair and i feel as if i could rob a bank or a jewelry store to prevent that jack burst into a delighted giggle through which john heard you wouldn't do such a thing and you mustn't talk that way before jack it was alice who spoke with a little catch in her voice that sometimes came halfway between a laugh and a sob and it was echoed by the two aunts railroads growled john with supreme contempt it would have been a great deal better if railroads had never been invented jack we shall have to get a prairie schooner and trek to the west jack's eyes shone like stars but he got no chance to say anything for with that outburst the springs of speech were loosened there was the clamor the chorus clamor of relatives indignant inquisitive sympathetic relatives all eager to help and all uneasily conscious that their own small measure of prosperity would hardly stand the strain he shook his head sadly in answer to the inquiry as to whether he could not borrow he had no security aunt mary did not fail to remind him that she had warned him at the time aunt janet in a thin but affectionate voice admitted that she had suffered in the same way heavily and then the clock ticked through a brief silence why don't you read your letters asked emily suddenly she stood absent-mindedly arranging the flowers with one finger busy already with plans for the future there was a small pile of letters on the center table quite within john's reach he began tearing open the envelopes in mechanical fashion throwing them untidily upon the floor as each one fell jack slid down and picked it up climbing back on his father's knee one was a wedding announcement one was a plumber's bill at the third john paused read looked up bewildered and read again why emily he exploded boyishly this can't be read that will you and tell me if i have lost my mind emily put down the roses and read the letter slowly wonderingly smiling even as her brother had smiled not uncle john and we were always so afraid of him twenty thousand dollars murmured john open-mouthed silence waited upon them until cousin austin broke the spell with i say would you mind if i looked over your shoulder and john flung him the letter with a little whoop of joy is this plain living or is this a fairy story he demanded quizzically i never thought of myself as a dark-eyed hero with a fortune dropping in my hands just in the nick of time a title ought to go with it the vibrant energy of the man was back again the dry humor which in sunny seasons quivered about his mouth was once more there the mocking incredulity of his words belied the growing look of peace and security in his face the years seemed slipping from him bringing him a mellow boyhood twenty thousand dollars isn't exactly a fortune john it will buy the place twice over exulted the man and we shan't have to start for the west in a prairie schooner right away shan't we papa asked little jack in hungry disappointment but the child's shrill voice had little chance where everybody was speaking at once aunt mary's well i hope you hang on to this and not be foolish again and cousin austin's you deserve it john and uncle howard's well i am glad shake and several other congratulatory remarks all came at once the poor old fellow the poor old fellow said john to himself softly rubbing his hands i suppose he died out in oklahoma all alone how he happened to will this to me i give up he didn't like me very well the very atmosphere of the room had changed once more a feeling of quiet pleasure pervaded it the full sense of home peace security came back with a suggestion of a kettle singing on the hearth though there was no kettle nearer than the kitchen but there's frank it must have been alice who suggested this and a something disturbing questioning crept into the air frank said john wareham suddenly why i've forgotten all about frank we haven't heard of him for more than fifteen years or so have we more than that answered emily he was in mexico the last we knew he may be living suggested john mexico is always in such a state 
i suppose the males can't be trusted we ought to find out said alice uncle john had cast him off suggested emily tentatively anxiously but he was uncle john's own son said alice earnestly compellingly and wasn't uncle john in the wrong uncle john was a queer customer said john hastily he was cranky no doubt about it but he wasn't crazy and if this lawyer's statement is correct i've got a good legal right to the twenty thousand haven't i of course you have said aunt mary but the moral right whispered alice what was the quarrel about anyway asked austin frank's marriage wasn't it i never heard much about it that was part of it said aunt janet frank you know fell in love with a little country girl whom his father did not want him to marry but he insisted on having his way and married her good for him nodded austin approvingly little jack glancing from one to another with wide blue eyes was silently weaving his philosophy of life and his interpretation of humanity uh, religion was mixed up in it in some way contributed john uncle grew to be something of a fanatic and he wanted them both to believe what he believed and they wouldn't or didn't or couldn't it was incompatibility of temper all round i dare say frank was a good son reminded alice he was patient with his father and he all but gave up his life for uncle john nursing him through diphtheria more and more the sweet persistent voice brought trouble and question into the atmosphere from which trouble and question had so suddenly cleared the new security began to seem unstable the new found joy a stolen thing even in the pauses the personality of the woman spoke from curtain and cushion and fireplace of this room of her devising she dominated the whole seeming the only presence there brother and sister and guests shrank in the radiance of her do you really think i ought to hunt frank up asked the man emily shook her head but doubtfully you probably couldn't find him after all these years i could try admitted john nonsense cried aunt mary over her embroidery you stay right where you are and pay off your mortgage a man who has worked as hard as you have and has had as much trouble ought to take a bit of good luck when it comes think how much good you could do with it murmured aunt janet as the pickpocket said when he put the stolen dime in the collection plate said austin but fortunately aunt janet did not understand uncle had a right to do what he pleased with his own said john defiantly if he chose to cast off his son for reasons which he considered sufficient he had the right but you cannot cast off your son persisted alice john we have a boy of our own you know that the obligation is one of all eternity you cannot get rid of fatherhood oh papa papa you hurt me squealed little john suddenly interrupted in his philosophy weaving confound it all cried john with sudden irritation isn't this just like life to hold out the rope just to grab it away again with a grin i won't i say what is mine is mine but it isn't yours did frank have any children he asked several i believe admitted emily reluctantly and he never got on he never got on and the twenty thousand might save their pesky little mexican souls the child's laughter rippled out across the shocked silence of the elders maybe uncle john left them something suggested emily for a man who tried such big things this doesn't seem like much money her brother shook his head the entire sum of which he stands possessed he read from the lawyer's letter you might make a few inquiries through the post i rather imagine the mexican mail service isn't very trustworthy suggested aunt mary hopefully he looked at her but in abstracted fashion as if it were not to aunt mary that he was listening i'll write to this oklahoma lawyer and then i must go to mexico isn't it a little quixotic it's most likely all kinds of foolishness like everything else i do groaned the man but it's what i'd want done for my little chap if i were dead and he alive and i had quarreled with him i suppose i could keep this money and save my skin but you couldn't keep it without finding out murmured alice because you are you and the real you is incapable of doing a mean thing 
you must do as you think best said emily at last maybe if you find frank he won't want it all but we'll divide knowing that his father willed it to you that may be as it may be said the man leaning back in his chair with the face of one listening but i go to mexico it's a queer game we play here and i'll be dashed if i can understand it but i'm going to play it as fairly as i know how so the voice of alice won of alice who had been dead for five long years end of story here now included are some biographical and interpretive notes by the editor charles swain thomas margaret sherwood a singularly sincere and graceful writer is professor of english literature at wellesley college the clear voice which here speaks under miss sherwood's guidance is the voice of the absent and individually as we read the story we listen sympathetically to the separate messages of those voices which have entered sympathetically into our past experiences and wisely guided or wisely thwarted our separate deeds a harvard graduate who had taken professor charles eliot norton's course in fine arts was years afterwards selecting a cravat pin in a jeweler's shop in paris as he finally decided upon one of plain simple and silently impressive design he said quote, i think professor norton would have chosen this end quote. in decisions minor and in decisions major we are almost invariably influenced by the unconscious thought of those whose counsel we value this significant truth miss sherwood has impressively revealed in the clearest voice end of section Section 19 of Atlantic Narratives Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Child by E. Nesbitt All over the pavement of the church spread the exaggerated cross-hatching of the old pew's oak, a Smithfield market of intersecting lines such as children made with cards, in the old days when kings and knaves had fat legs bulging above their serviceable feet, and queens had skirts to their gowns, and were not cut across their royal middles, by mirrors reflecting only the bedizened torso of them, and the charge, heart trefoil or the like, in the right-hand top corner of the oblong that framed them. The pews had qualities, tall fat hassocks, red cushions, a comparative seclusion, and, in the case of the affluent, red curtains drawn at sermon time. The child, wearied by the spectacle of a plump divine in black gown and Geneva bands, thumping the pulpit cushions in the madness of incomprehensible oratory, surrendered his ears to the noise of intonations which, in his own trouble, would have earned the reprimand, naughty temper. His eyes, however, were, through some oversight of the gods of his universe, still his own, they found their own pasture, not, to be sure, the argent and sable of gowns and bands, still less the gules of flushed denunciatory gills. There is a fair pasture in an old church, which, when Norman work was broken down, men loved and built again as from the heart, with pillars and arches, which, to their rude time, symbolized all that the heart desires to materialize in symbolic stone the fretted tombs where the effigies of warrior and priest lay lifelike in dead marble, the fretted canopies that brooded above their rest, tall pillars like the trunks of the pine woods that smelt so sweet, the marvel of the timbered roof, turned upside down it would be like a ship, and what could be easier then to turn it upside down? Imagination shrank bashfully from the pulpit already tightly tenanted, but the triforium was plainly and beautifully empty there one could walk squeezing happily through the deep thin arches and treading carefully by the unguarded narrow ledge only if one played too long in the roof aunts nudged and urgent whispers insisted that one must not look about like that in church when this moment came it came always as a crisis foreseen half dreaded half longed for 
After that the child kept his eyes lowered and looked only at the faded red hassocks from which the straw bulged, and in brief guarded intimate moments at the other child. The other child was kneeling always, whether the congregation knelt or stood or sat. Its hands were clasped, its face was raised, but its back bowed under a weight, the weight of the font, for the other child was of marble and knelt always in the church Sundays and weekdays. There had been once three marble figures holding up the shallow basin, but two had crumbled or been broken away, and now it seemed that the whole weight of the superimposed marble rested on those slender shoulders. The child who was not marble was sorry for the other. He must be very tired. The child who was not marble, his name was Ernst, that child of weary eyes and bored brain, pitied the marble boy while he envied him. "'I suppose he doesn't really feel if he's stone,' he said. "'That's what they mean by the stony-hearted tyrant. "'But if he does feel, how jolly it would be if he could come out and sit in my pew, "'or if I could creep under the font beside him. "'If he would move a little, there would be just room for me.' "'The first time that Ernst ever saw the marble child move was on the hottest Sunday in the year.' The walk across the fields had been a breathless penance. The ground burned the soles of Ernst's feet as red-hot plowshares the feet of saints. The corn was cut and stood in stiff yellow stooks, and the shadows were very black. The sky was light, except in the west beyond the pine trees where blue-black clouds were piled. "'Like witches' feather beds,' said Aunt Harriet, shaking out the folds of her lace shawl. "'Not before the child, dear,' whispered Aunt Emmeline. Ernst heard her, of course. It was always like that. As soon as anyone spoke about anything interesting, Aunt Emmeline intervened. Ernst walked along, very melancholy in his starched frill. The dust had whitened his strapped shoes, and there was a wrinkle in one of his white socks. "'Pull it up, child, pull it up,' said Aunt Jessie and shielded from the world by the vast silk-veiled crinolines of three full-sized aunts, he pulled it up. On the way to church, and, indeed, in all walks abroad, you held the hand of an aunt. The circumferent crinolines made holding an arm's-length business very tiring. Ernst was always glad when, in the porch, the hand was dropped. It was just as the porch was reached that the first lonely roll of thunder broke over the hills. "'I knew it!' said Aunt Jessie in triumph, but you would wear your blue silk. There was no more thunder till after the second lesson, which was hardly ever as interesting as the first, Ernst thought. The marble child looked more tired than usual, and Ernst lost himself in a dream game where both of them got out from prison and played hide-and-seek among the tombstones. Then the thunder cracked deafeningly right over the church. Ernst forgot to stand up, and even the clergyman waited till it died away. It was a most exciting service, well worth coming to church for, and afterwards people crowded in the wide porch and wondered whether it would clear, and wished they had brought their umbrellas. Some went back and sat in their pews till the servants should have had time to go home and return with umbrellas and cloaks. The more impetuous made clumsy rushes between the showers, bonnets bent, skirts held well up. Many a Sunday dress was ruined that day, many a bonnet fell from best to second best. And it was when Aunt Jessie whispered to him to sit still and be a good boy and learn a hymn, that he looked to the marble child with, "'Isn't it a shame?' in his heart and his eyes, and the marble child looked back, "'Never mind, it will soon be over,' and held out its marble hands. Ernst saw them come toward him reaching well beyond the rim of the basin under which they had always, till now, stayed. "'Oh!' said Ernst, quite out loud, and, dropping the hymn-book, held out his hands, or began to hold them out, for before he had done more than sketch the gesture, he remembered that marble does not move, and that one must not be silly. All the same, marble had moved. Also, Ernst had spoken out loud in church. Unspeakable disgrace!' He was taken home in conscious ignominy, treading in all the puddles to distract his mind from his condition. 
He was put to bed early as a punishment, instead of sitting up and learning his catechism under the charge of one of the maids while the aunts went to evening church. This, while it was terrible to Ernst, was in the nature of a reprieve to the housemaid, who found means to modify her own consequent loneliness. Faraway whispers and laughs from the back or kitchen windows assured Ernst that the front or polite side of the house was unguarded. He got up, simulated the appearance of the completely dressed, and went down the carpeted stairs, through the rosewood-furnished drawing-room, rose-scented and still as a deathbed, and so out through the French windows to the lawn, where already the beginnings of dew lay softly. His going out had no definite aim. It was simply an act of rebellion, such as, secure from observation, the timid may achieve, a demonstration akin to putting the tongue out behind people's backs. Having got himself out on the lawn, he made haste to hide in the shrubbery, disheartened by a baffling consciousness of the futility of safe revenges. What is the tongue put out behind the back of the enemy without the applause of some admirer? The red rays of the setting sun made splendor in the dripping shrubbery. I wish I hadn't, said Ernst. But it seemed silly to go back now, just to go out and to go back, so he went farther into the shrubbery and got out at the other side where the shrubbery slopes down into the wood and it was nearly dark there so nearly that the child felt more alone than ever and then quite suddenly he was not alone hands parted the hazels and a face he knew looked out from between them he knew the face and yet the child he saw was not any of the children he knew well said the child with the face he knew "'I've been watching you. What did you come out for?' "'I was put to bed. Do you not like it? Not when it's for punishment.' "'If you will go back now,' said the strange child, "'I'll come and play with you after you're asleep.' "'You daren't. Suppose the aunts catch you.' "'They won't,' said the child, shaking its head and laughing. "'I'll race you to the house.' Ernst ran. "'He won the race.' for the other child was not there at all when he reached the house. "'How odd,' he said. But he was tired, and there was thunder again, and it was beginning to rain large spots as big as pennies on the steps of the French window. So he went back to bed, too sleepy to worry about the question of where he had seen the child before, and only a little disappointed because his revenge had been so brief and inadequate.' Then he fell asleep, and dreamed that the marble child had crept out from under the font, and that he and it were playing hide-and-seek among the pews in the gallery at church. It was a delightful dream, and lasted all night, and when he woke he knew that the child he had seen in the woods in yesterday's last light was the marble child from the church. This did not surprise him as much as it would surprise you— the world where children live is so full of amazing and incredible-looking things that turn out to be quite real, and if Lot's wife could be turned into a pillar of salt, why should not a marble child turn into a real one? It was all quite plain to Ernst, but he did not tell anyone because he had a feeling that it might not be easy to make it plain to them. "'That child doesn't look quite the thing,' said Aunt Emmeline at breakfast. "'A dose of Gregory's, I think, at eleven. Ernst Morning was blighted. "'Did you ever take Gregory's powder? "'It is worse than quinine, worse than senna, "'worse than anything except castor oil. "'But Ernst had to take it in raspberry jam. "'And don't make such faces,' said Aunt Emmeline, "'rinsing the spoon at the pantry sink. "'You know it's all for your own good.' as if the thought that it is for one's own good ever kept any one from making faces. The aunts were kind in their grown-up crinolined way, but Ernst wanted someone to play with. Every night in his dreams he played with the marble child, and at church on Sunday the marble child still held out its hands farther than before. "'Come along, then,' Ernst said to it, in that voice with which the heart speaks to heart. "'Come and sit with me behind the red curtains. Come!' The marble child did not look at him. Its head seemed to be bent farther forward than ever before. When it came to the second hymn, Ernst had an inspiration. 
all the rest of the church full, sleepy, and suitable, were singing, The rosy hues of early dawn, the brightness of the day, the crimson of the sunset sky, how fast they fade away. Ernst turned his head toward the marble child and softly mouthed, you could hardly call it singing. The rosy twos of early dawn, the brightness of the day. Come out, come out, come out, come out, come out with me and play. And he pictured the rapture of that moment when the marble child should respond to this appeal, creep out from under the font, and come and sit beside him on the red cushions, beyond the red curtains. The aunts would not see, of course. They never saw the things that mattered. No one would see except Ernst. He looked hard at the marble child. "'You must come out,' he said, and again, "'You must come, you must.' And the marble child did come. It crept out and came to sit by him, holding his hand. It was a cold hand, certainly, but it did not feel like marble. And the next thing he knew, an aunt was shaking him and whispering with fierceness, tempered by reverence for the sacred edifice, "'Wake up, Ernst! How can you be so naughty?' and the marble child was back in its place under the font. When Ernst looks back on that summer, it seems to have thundered every time he went to church, but of course this cannot really have been the case. But it was certainly a very lowering, purple-skied day which saw him stealthily start on the adventure of his little life. He was weary of aunts. They were kind, yet just. They told him so, and he believed them, but their justice was exactly like other people's nagging, and their kindness he did not want at all. He wanted someone to play with. "'May we walk up to the churchyard?' was a request at first received graciously as showing a serious spirit. But its reiteration was considered morbid, and his walks took the more dusty direction of the county asylum." His longing for the only child he knew, the marble child, exacerbated by denial, drove him to rebellion. He would run away. He would live with the marble child in the big church porch. They would eat berries from the wood nearby, just as children did in books, and hide there when people came to church. So he watched his opportunity and went quietly out through the French window, skirted the side of the house where all the windows were blank because of the old window tax, took the narrow strip of lawn at a breathless run, and found safe cover among the rhododendrons. The church door was locked, of course, but he knew where there was a broken pane in the vestry window, and his eye had marked the lopsided tombstone underneath it. By climbing upon that and getting a knee in the carved waterspout, he did it, got his hand through, turned the catch of the window, and fell through upon the dusty table of the vestry. The door was ajar, and he passed into the empty church. It seemed very large and gray now that he had it to himself. His feet made a loud echoing noise that was disconcerting. He had meant to call out, Here I am, but in the face of these echoes he could not. He found the marble child, its head bent more than ever, its hands reaching out quite beyond the edge of the font, and when he was quite close he whispered, "'Here I am. Come and play.' But his voice trembled a little. The marble child was so plainly marble, and yet it had not always been marble. He was not sure. Yet, "'I am sure,' he said. "'You did talk to me in the shrubbery, didn't you?' But the marble child did not move or speak. "'You did come and hold my hand last Sunday,' he said a little louder. And only the empty echoes answered him. "'Come out,' he said then, almost afraid now of the church's insistent silence. "'I've come to live with you altogether. Come out of your marble. Do come out.' He reached up to stroke the marble cheek. A sound thrilled him, a loud, everyday sound the big key turning in the lock of the south door. The aunts. Now they'll take me back, said Ernst. You might have come. But it was not the aunts. It was the old pew-opener come to scrub the chancel. She came slowly in with pail and brush. The pail slopped a little water onto the floor close to Ernst as she passed him, not seeing. 
Then the marble child moved, turned toward Ernst with speaking lips and eyes that saw. "'You can stay with me forever, if you like,' it said. "'But you'll have to see things happen. I have seen things happen.' "'What sort of things?' Ernst asked. "'Terrible things.' "'What things shall I have to see?' "'Her.' The marble child moved a free arm to point to the old woman on the chancel steps. "'And your aunt, who will be here presently looking for you. "'Do you hear the thunder? Presently the lightning will strike the church. "'It won't hurt us, but it will fall on them.' Ernst remembered in a flash how kind Aunt Emmeline had been when he was ill, how Aunt Jessie had given him his chessmen, and Aunt Harriet had taught him how to make paper rosettes for picture frames. "'I must go and tell them,' he said. "'If you go, you'll never see me again,' said the marble child, and put its arms around his neck. "'Can't I come back to you when I've told them?' Ernst asked, returning the embrace. "'There will be no coming back,' said the marble child. "'But I want you. I love you best of everybody in the world,' Ernst said. "'I know. I'll stay with you,' said Ernst. The marble child said nothing. "'But if I don't tell them, I shall be the same as a murderer,' Ernst whispered. "'Oh, let me go and come back to you.' "'I shall not be here.' "'But I must go. I must,' said Ernst, torn between love and duty. "'Yes.' "'And I shan't have you any more?' the living child urged. "'You shall have me in your heart,' said the marble child. That's where I want to be. That's my real home. They kissed each other again. It was certainly a direct providence, Aunt Emmeline used to say in latter years to really sympathetic friends, that I thought of going up to the church when I did. Otherwise nothing could have saved dear Ernst. He was terrified, quite crazed with fright, poor child, and he rushed out at me from behind our pew, shouting— "'Come away, come away, Auntie, come away,' and dragged me out. Mrs. Meadows providentially followed to see what it was all about, and the next thing was the catastrophe. "'The church was struck by a thunderbolt, was it not?' the sympathetic friend asked. "'It was indeed a deafening crash, my dear, and then the church slowly crumbled before our eyes. The south wall broke like a slice of cake when you break it across, and the noise and the dust—' Mrs. Meadows never had her hearing again, poor thing, and her mind was a little affected, too. I became unconscious, and Ernst, well, it was altogether too much for the child. He lay between life and death for weeks. Shock to the system, the physician said. He had been rather run down before. We had to get a little cousin to come and live with us afterwards. The physician said that he required young society." "'It must indeed have been a shock,' says the sympathetic friend, who knows there is more to come. "'His intellect was quite changed, my dear,' Aunt Emmeline resumes. "'On regaining consciousness he demanded the marble child, cried and raved, my dear, always about the marble child. It appeared he had had fancies about one of the little angels that supported the old font. Not the present font, my dear,' We presented that as a token of gratitude to Providence for our escape. Of course we checked his fancifulness as well as we could, but it lasted quite a long time. What became of the little marble angel, the friend inquires, as in friendship bound? Crushed to powder, dear, in the awful wreck of the church, not a trace of it could be found, and poor Mrs. Meadows, so dreadful those delusions. "'What form did her delusions take?' the friend, anxious to be done with the old story, hastily asks. "'Well, she always declared that two children ran out to warn me, and that one of them was very unusual-looking. "'It wasn't no flesh and blood, ma'am,' she used to say in her ungrammatical way. "'It was a little angel that taken care of Master Ernst. "'It had hold of his hand, and I say it was his garden angel, "'and its face was as bright as a lily in the sun.' "'The friend glances at the India cabinet, "'and Aunt Emmeline rises and unlocks it. "'Ernst must have been behaving in a very naughty and destructive way in the church, 
but the physician said he was not quite himself probably for when they got him home and undressed him they found this in his hand then the sympathizing friend polishes her glasses and looks not for the first time at the relic from the drawer of the india cabinet it is a white marble finger thus flow the reminiscences of aunt emmeline the memories of ernst run as this tale runs end of story biographical and interpretive notes by charles swain thomas e nesbitt mrs hubert bland is an english writer who for many years has enjoyed widespread and deserved popularity as a writer of children's books the world where children live is so full of amazing and incredible-looking things that turn out to be quite real. This sentence from the story supplies us with the theme the wording of the bald analyst requires. For him who simply reads for the mere narrative, no such analyzing is really necessary, provided there still linger with him the manifold fancies that peopled his childhood. Of course, Ernst was an extraordinary child— like Shelley or William Blake, it may be, just such a child as Hawthorne would adore. To appreciate the story in all its fineness, we must ourselves have something of that abnormality, else we shall be as impervious as the crinoline aunts, and as unsympathetic toward Ernst's experience as are some readers to Hawthorne's fanciful snow image. End of section 19《Section 20 of Atlantic Narratives》Modern Short Stories》published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The One Left by E. V. Lucas, Part One. He had become very ill, could hardly move from where he lay, and she, who loved him and was to have married him, and spent all her waking hours in thinking what she could do for him, persuaded him to have a telephone installed and brought to his bedside so that he and she could talk, and he could talk with others too. Every night he rang her up, and they had a long conversation, many times in the day also. Nothing, as it happened, could have saved his life, but this modern device lightened his last weeks. His death, a third blast at her hopes, made no difference to her devotion. She merely installed his memory in the place of his rich personality and loved that. He, almost more than ever, was her standard. What he would have liked, she did. What he would have disliked, she left undone. Although that, he swayed her utterly, and under his dominion she was equable and gentle, although broken at heart. She took all things as they came, since how could anything matter, now that everything that mattered was over one perplexity only had power to trouble her and that was the wonder the amazement the horror not only that so much knowledge and kindliness and sympathy and all that made for the world's good and happiness should be so wantonly extinguished but that no touch of the vanished hand should be permitted to the one soul now left behind with whom his soul had been fused this she could neither understand nor forgive religious she had never been in the ordinary sense, although such religion as must sway a true idealistic lover was hers. But now she broke even from such slender ties as had held her to orthodoxy. She threw off the creed of her parents as naturally and simply as if it were a borrowed garment, and sank into her sorrow, which was also her joy, without another thought of here or hereafter. So it went on for a year or so, during which time his house had remained empty, save for a caretaker, for she, who was rich, could not bear that any one else should live there, and his room exactly as he had died in it. Part two. One evening she dined out. Her next neighbor on one side was a young American engineer, and in their conversation they came in time to the topic of invention, and the curious attitude for inventiveness shown by the American race. It was a case, said the engineer, of supply following demand all americans regard time and labor-saving appliances and they obtained them where servants abounded and there was no servant problem as in england and on the continent the need for such contrivances was not acute and so on 
the conversation thus begun reached at last specific inventions and the engineer told of a remarkable one which had come under his notice just before he left new york you will probably not believe me he said the thing sounds incredible but then who would have believed once that there could be a telegraph and still less a telephone who would have believed that the camera would ever be anything but a dream i will tell you what this is it is a machine in which you insert a portion no matter how small of a telephone wire and by turning a handle you compel this piece of wire to give back every message that has ever passed over it she held her heart this really exists she forced herself to ask actually said the engineer but when i left home the inventor was in a difficulty all the messages were coming out all right but backwards naturally the reproduction would be from the most recent to the less recent by writing down the words and then reversing them the investigator could of course get at what he was wanting i may say that the invention is for the new york police but my friend is convinced that he can devise some mechanical system of reversing at the time which will make the messages read forward as they should just think of the excitement of the detective listening through all the voices and ordinary conversations on the wire for the one voice and the one sentence that will give him his long desired clue but are you ill no no she said although her face was a ghastly white no it is nothing the room is a little hot tell me some more about your inventive friend is he wealthy indeed no said the engineer that is his trouble if he had more money or if he had some rich backers who believed in him he might do wonders i should like to help him she said this kind of work interests me could you not cable him to come over and bring the thing with him i would gladly finance him i want some sporting outlet like that for my money cable yes cable there are things that one does by impulse or not at all the butler here will get your form part three she had been to the empty house that day with an employee of the telephone company and they had extracted a foot of the precious wire a few minutes ago she had held it in her trembling fingers and placed it in the machine now she carefully locked the door and drew the heavy curtain over it and carried the machine to the farthest corner of the room there with a sigh of relief and tense and almost terrible anticipation she sat down and placed her ear to the receiver and began to turn the handle his voice sounded at once are you there it was quite clear so clear and unmistakable and actual that her hand paused on the handle and she bowed her throbbing head she turned on are you there the familiar tones repeated and then the reply yes who is it in a woman's voice then he spoke again ernest he said is it helen again her hand paused helen that rubbishy little woman he had known all his life and was on such good terms with she remembered now that she had been away when the telephone was installed and others had talked on it before her it could not be helped she had meant to be the first but circumstances prevented there must be many conversations before she came to her own she would have to listen to them all she turned on and the laughing chaffing conversation with this foolish little helen person repeated itself out of the past now so tragic to other talks with other friends and now and then with a tradesman she had to listen but at last came her hour is it you she heard her own voice saying knowing it was her own rather by instinct than by hearing is it you but i know it is how distinctly you speak yes it's me and the soft vibrant love how are you dear better i hope have you missed me missed you and then the endearments the confidences the hopes and fears the plans for the morrow the plans for all life as she listened the tears ran down her face but still she turned on and on sometimes he was so hopeful and bright and again so despairing she remembered the occasion of every word once she had dined out and had gone to the theatre it was an engagement she could not well refuse it was an amusing play and she was in good spirits she rang him up between the acts and found him depressed hurrying home she had settled down to talk to him at her ease how it all came back to her now are you there my dearest yes but oh so tired so old it is a bad day everyone has been complaining of tiredness today you say that because you are kind just to comfort me it's no use i can see so clearly sometimes 
I shall never get well. Tonight I know it. My darling, no. And then silence. Complete, terrifying. She had rang up without effect. He had fainted, she thought, and had dropped the receiver. She was in a fever of agony. She leaped into a cab and drove to his house. The nurse reassured her. He had begun to sob and didn't want her to know it. And now he was asleep. But there was no sleep for her that night. What if he were right? If he really knew? In her heart she feared that he did. With the rest of her she fought that fear. As she listened, the tears ran down her face. But still, she turned on and on. She sat there for hours before the last words came. The last he was ever to speak over the wire. It was to make an engagement. He had rallied wonderfully at the end and was confident of recovery. She was to bring her modiste to his room at eleven o'clock the next morning with her patterns, that he might help in choosing a new dress. He had insisted on it, the dress she was to wear on his first outing. At eleven, he had said. Mind you don't forget, but then you'd never forget anything. Good night once more, my sweet. Good night. She had never seen him again alive. He had died before the morning. She put the machine away and looked out of the window. The sun had risen. The sky was on fire with the promise of a beautiful day. Worn out, she fell asleep. To wake? To what? To such a wakening as there is for those who never forget anything. Part 4 Every night found her bending over the machine. She had learned now when not to listen. She had timed the reproduction absolutely, and watch in hand, she waited until the other messages were done, and her own voice began. There was no condensing possible. One must either each time have every conversation, or stop it. But how could she stop it before the end? Locking the door and drawing the heavy curtain, she would sit down in the far corner and begin to turn. She knew just how fast to turn for others, so slowly for herself. When the watch gave her the signal, she would begin to listen. Is that you? Is that you? But I know it is. How distinctly you speak. Yes, it's me, and the soft, vibrant love. How are you, dear? Better, I hope. Have you missed me? Missed you. End of story. Biographical and interpretive notes by Charles Swain Thomas. Evie Lucas is an English essayist, a lover, and biographer of Lamb. Known for many delicate and appreciative essays, and for books of travel in familiar places. It is same occasionally only that Mr. Lucas addresses himself to fiction. This admirably written story, so brief as to be little more than a sketch, is rich in emotional values which are safely held within the bonds of restraint. Scientifically, I am told there is nothing wrong in the description of the ingenious device which provides the means for the expression of the emotion, though readers unfamiliar with such devices may question the verisimilitude of the action. It is but one instance among thousands which provide modern literature with a broadened range within the field of realism. End of section 20. Recorded by Julian Niedermeyer. Section 21 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legacy of Richard Hughes by Margaret Lynn. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 1 Rachel Marquis paused a moment with her hand on the library door. She had had John placed in here because it was the room she herself loved best, and she knew it was here she would prefer to sit beside him in these last hours of waiting. Yet she had hesitated to come down, and even now, with her hand on the doorknob, she lingered again to re-strengthen herself before entering. The very unusualness of an unfamiliar sight in the familiar room would add, she knew, to the sharp strangeness of the whole event. She almost hoped, as she waited this moment, for another practical duty of some sort which would postpone again her entrance to the room. But no sound came from any part of the silenced house, and she opened the door and entered. 
the long casket stood awkwardly across the blank fireplace, for she had chosen to give no direction to the undertaker, and he had followed his own professional judgment. Everything was arranged, however, with a sort of intention which indicated the intrusion of the professional into the private. In spite of the stronger feeling of the moment, Rachel Marquis noticed this with sharp disapproval. But she went directly to the chair which had been placed beside the casket and seated herself, bowing her head long on her folded arms before she looked on the familiar face beside her. It was now only twenty-four hours since the strange accident had happened, and she had not yet adjusted herself even so far as to determine her fundamental emotion. It was grief, of course, but the kind or degree of that grief was still undefined. The hours since they had brought him home had been so full of the unfamiliar practical things which arise at such a time, of the sudden necessities and small perplexities which muddle and chafe sorrow, that there had been scarcely a moment for her to look consciously at the great fact. Even now, as she covered her eyes, to be the more alone with herself, she felt rather a welcoming of momentary inactivity than the relaxation of grief. She realized with a sort of pang of disapproval that she did not need to relax from any tension of anguish. She did not know what she wished to say to herself in this communion. She was sorry, bitterly sorry. But what elements went into the making of that grief, she could not yet tell. So she leaned with covered eyes, almost as if she were waiting for something outside of herself to give her a cue. As the minutes passed, however, the great simple fact that John was dead, and that his place beside her would now be empty, engrossed all supplementary feeling, and her genuine regret had its way. She wept long, and even more bitterly, absorbed as one may be in the mere physical expression of grief. The activity of sorrow overcame thought for a time, and left her no energy for analysis of feeling. Death alone seemed enough to weep over, and her tears still fell. At last, as if having reached a natural period, she rose and moved away to the window and sat down there, in a quiet reverie of sadness. She was sorry for the life cut off, shocked at the abruptness and completeness of the tragedy. John himself, she was sure, the assertive, energizing John, would have hated this sudden subduing of himself, and she sympathized with such revolt. Sorry, sorry for it all. As she thought, she looked gravely out across the garden, the gay stretch to which John had given so much time. She had never understood his devotion to that garden. He had not been ready to spend money on things to give aesthetic pleasure in the house, although in practical matters he had been willing enough to make outlays ever since his business had been secure. She thought of their new car, of the signs of prosperity in their living. Poor John, she said at last with a deep sigh, when aware of the nodding line of rare dahlias on which her eyes were resting, she thought of all the pains he had taken in the propagation and selection of them. She had come to recognize this lavishness of care and money as a sort of blind expression of the one aesthetic element in his nature, and had felt a quiet approval of it. Poor John, she sighed again, and turned from the window to go. But even as she did so, the simplicity of her mood passed, and the old complexity of feeling returned with a keenness which was, for the moment, bewildering. As she left the window, the long black shape across the fireplace confronted her again, and she paused, startled anew. It was so strange and so tremendous a thing in her room, for the library was, above everything else in the world, hers. It was such a room as shows it has been taking on character through succeeding decades, cumulative of its type, slowly drawing to itself an atmosphere of fineness and greatness. The credit of it belonged only remotely to Rachel Marquis. She was the possessor, but not the maker of it. She had kept it and loved it, but her own contribution to it had been slight. A few shelves of new books, not yet mellowed down to the tone of the others, standing as if waiting to be proved, and a bit of renewing of texture here and there, whose freshness showed need of the softening of time, were the only marks of her hand or taste. But it was such a room as any lover of the long effects of books would cherish. In the midst of its harmonies, the heavy black box undoubtedly looked harsh and intrusive. 
rachel recognized as a sort of confidence with herself that bringing it here was an invasion because she loved the room herself she had placed john here without thought of the inappropriateness of the act but now the incongruity of the choice struck her why should he be brought here she thought pitifully to the room he never frequented where she scarcely welcomed him she acknowledged why should she sit beside him here when she had so seldom done so before she remembered very well the manner with which he occasionally sought her here tentative unfamiliar and yet assertive she had resented every element of that manner anywhere else in the house he was more nearly himself here everything she did not desire in him was accentuated it had been she thought with an instinctive desire to do the best for him in every way that she had directed that he should be placed here just as she had ordered everything of the choicest and had given her most careful attention and taste to every detail but this thought had been a failure poor john she said gently once more with a pity in her thought all the greater for this very incongruity as she came over and stood beside him but as her eyes rested on his face she felt almost compelled to withdraw the phrase the dead man seemed to allow no such pity the unfamiliar in the familiar which is stranger than a new thing held her startled attention as she looked she had thought she knew john marquis to the last shred of his character but death seemed to have laid a fineness she had never known over the stubbornness and taciturnity of the face the dignity of the last great experience of his life seemed to mark him he seemed to be gathering himself away from her pitying kindness very soon she went out again and closed the door part two when richard hughes the last of his family left his mother's old home to john and rachel marquis no one had wondered rachel was a sort of cousin and john too a distant connection by somebody's marriage and they lived in the town and nothing was more natural than that he should give them a home there and whatever else he had to leave what no one knew but rachel was that richard hughes had wished to marry her and that she had refused him and chosen john marquis instead richard hughes fifteen years her senior quiet and inexpressive shut in with books and remote from life was far less to her mind than john marquis who was of her own generation with whom she went to parties and talked the light talk of youth and had a thousand things in common as she thought john was bright and jolly and played tennis and danced with her and took her out in a canoe and was sweet-tempered and loved to laugh and in between times talked seriously about the business he was starting and the money he expected to make john belonged to the whole format of her life at that time and it was perfectly natural to choose to marry him with the expectation that life would go on as she and john had both known it and liked it in other homes comfortable sensible ambitious of practical things real as their kind would call it it seemed an impossible thing for her not to marry john in the first years of their marriage she was proud of coming quickly to understand john's business she was proud of her management and her well-timed economies proud that john could talk affairs over with her with satisfaction that she was beginning to take the place her mother and other successful women had taken in practical life but after two or three years had passed the space taken by practical things in her life began to shrink her familiarity with them detracted from their interest and allowed her to dispose of them more readily she began to feel a restlessness which called for new interests at the same time john's affairs were not prospering difficulties he could not manage hampered him all rachel's advice and economies were of little help among the inevitable conditions of the time she was becoming tired of the continual effort to acquire and impatient of the atmosphere of practical things but she made a show of readiness when he suggested that they give up the cheerful modern home they had fitted about themselves with the conventions of comfort and the furnishings and decorations to which they had been adapted it was just at this time that richard hughes left them his home and the little money he owned nothing could have been more opportune for them whatever other feelings john may have had were absorbed in sheer relief at the assistance the bequest brought him the money with that from the sale of their own house tided him over his difficulties and even helped to develop his business further 
rachel concealed her reluctance at moving into the out-of-date old house with its antiquated furnishings and made a show of welcoming their fortune as a good partner should she could hardly tell when the consciousness of the house began to have its influence upon her from the first john absorbed in business left all practical things to her feeling that the house was more hers than his anyway she in a mood of vague compunction and desire to compensate for she hardly knew what made it a point of honor to dispose of all their own furniture chosen with such satisfaction and complacency and settled among the dull tones and quiet spaces of the old house gay old place isn't it said john walking through the house after they were established rachel assented with a cheerful smile oh well he went on settling down with his trade journals which looked sadly out of place in the dim library we can stand it for a while some time we can have what we want again it was months before he recurred to the subject directly then one sunday he looked about him as he stretched in an old easy chair and said abruptly we are getting pretty well settled down here i didn't think the old place would be so comfortable it is more than comfortable said rachel quietly I wonder why Richard ever left it to us. Have you ever figured it out? Oh, he had no nearer relatives that he knew. Rachel tried to speak in a matter-of-fact way, but instead she hesitated and flushed a little. John looked at her closely. Do you know any other reason? he asked curiously. Rachel hesitated again. Mere reticence on past affairs was one thing. Positively keeping a secret from her husband was another richard wanted to marry me once she said but i don't think that had anything to do with it she added hastily when was that oh before i was engaged to you said rachel and smiled at him john said nothing more but sat tapping his knee with his folded newspaper as was his habit when in thought presently he rose and strolled away rachel could not help resenting his silence which left her in discomfort when so much had been said he should have said more if only to put her at her ease for days afterwards she expected him to return to the subject and when he did not do so she continued to resent the implication he seemed to be making at this time the house itself had already begun to have its effect upon her rachel could hardly tell when she stopped looking wistfully at the sectional bookcases and mission furniture of her acquaintances but soon after she moved into it the house had ceased to be to her merely a house with her conventionally modern notions of beauty in furnishings she had first been surprised to find how at rest and how satisfied she was in this house which had met in a generous way the needs and tastes of another generation but met few of those to which she had been trained she had not known that it was in her to find charm in such a house but from the time when she first became aware of the positive quality of the place she became more and more awake to its existence she wondered at it but it held her attention constantly more firmly at last she found that behind the entity of the house lay that which had made it the personality of the generations gone and especially of its last owner the quality of the whole place with its solidity of walls and generosity of room along with its plain sincerity in every detail seemed to indicate praiseworthiness not only in the first builder but in all later possessors it became a meritorious thing to have and to keep a house like this she remembered something of the sacrifices that richard hughes had made to retain it and warmed with pride of him at the recollection the whole place reflected him and the people who had made him gradually rachel grew in pride of the house and of her heritage as she lived there month by month she found herself enveloped in its atmosphere and growing toward its proportions at first she entered the library with timidity and an uncomfortable strangeness even one who had only very superficial intellectual tastes must have felt a sort of awe before its accumulation of books and their accompaniments when rachel and john had first begun to make a home they had placed the making of a library among their ambitions for it and had taken pleasure in adding a few gaily bound novels each year to the small united collection which they had begun they had enjoyed seeing their few shelves grow and knowing that they had so many of the popular books of which their friends talked when they came to the hughes home rachel had crowded their party-colored collection into the shelves of the library there weeding out others to make room for their own
but on a later day as she re-entered the room she felt a shock at the incongruity presented and to john's puzzlement gathered their own books into a corner by themselves where a curtain safely hid them their garish triviality had no place among these mellowed long-tried volumes john however had looked the old volumes over and pronounced them a dry lot give him something fresher but rachel perceived that there had been something in the choosing of these books which she had never really known to her books had been an accessory an incidental thing hypothetically an enrichment of life but not an essential she had thought of intellectual exercise as an intermittent thing to be taken up or laid down as suited the mood of the time but here was a people who chose books not merely as a desirable possession and ornamental furnishing but as an unquestioned necessity gradually as she continued to handle and know their books she evoked for herself the earlier presences of the house most of all richard hughes in the long hours which she now spent alone about the house she found herself living more constantly in the companionship with those minds they were not only an atmosphere but sometimes almost a positive presence it entertained her to go over the books one by one sometimes deciding who had chosen this one and that one and for what reason and picturing the occasion of its coming to his hand as her knowledge of the library grew she took more and more pleasure in this tracing the taste of one owner or another in the recurrence of a subject or in successive accretions she as she learned glowed over her collection of first editions of modern works since they had been chosen not as first editions but in their own time as works for which an appreciative hand was eagerly waiting and since richard hughes was the only one of her predecessors in the library whom she had known she found herself embodying all the others in him she knew him now better than she had ever known him she could detect his additions to the treasures of the house and as her own knowledge increased could trace his using of the resources which had been handed down to him she began to take pleasure in following what she thought had been his path in taste and knowledge gradually matching her mind to his own her pride in the room went through successive stages in her first days of satisfaction in mere proprietorship of so respectable and worthy a possession she took pleasure in unostentatious exhibition of it she liked to take guests there in a natural sort of way and to be found sitting there by unexpected callers she liked the eminently admirable background of the rows of books for social episodes but as her knowledge of the library grew that stage passed as she went from familiarity to intimacy she began to desire that it should be an exclusive intimacy she no longer took callers to the room and when familiar acquaintances found their way there she was uneasy at their handling of the books and impatient of their discussion of them she now seldom spontaneously took strangers there in time she had come to group john with all the others the only companionship that she desired in the library was an imagined one john's attitude had more and more set her apart in this companionship his dislike for the house had grown steadily more obvious as the months and years passed it showed itself in a lack of home pride in open contempt for the old-fashioned elements of the place in reluctance to make even necessary expenditure upon it but rachel herself had hardly guessed the strength of his feeling until one day when she discovered among richard hughes's papers what seemed to be a memorandum for a codicil to his will which would make a gift of a thousand dollars to a little public library of the town she took the note directly to john i think we ought to do this she said john looked at the paper and laid it down i don't see that we're obliged to he answered shortly it is what he intended to do and we got the money she said with too patient a manner as if explaining the moral point to him we should give it in his name it is enough to have to live in richard hughes's house i don't care to set up a memorial for him besides but john she urged herself to argue is it honest there is more than one kind of honesty said john shortly in a tone which checked further answer i can't afford it he added after a moment as the final word 
she left him in an anger which it seemed to her she would feel all her life but gradually it became less an act of feeling than a part of all her unformulated opinion of him he had not followed her a single step in the development which had resulted from her awakening to the spirit of the house in time he came to ignore the library altogether as part of the house and by degrees fitted up an incongruous little lounging place upstairs rachel came to regard his whole attitude toward the place and the man who had owned it as belonging to his mental and aesthetic plane his jealous ingratitude seemed not a separate feeling but only an element of his character richard hughes she now understood very well had known her very little and had loved only her prettiness and light girlishness charms which were different from anything in his own life the recollection of that episode did not flatter her now or even afford her any special gratification but she loved to live side by side with the embodiment she had recreated for herself and was proud to feel her spirit matching its spirit she sometimes felt with her growing imagination that she was living in the house not with john but with these presences of the past most of all with richard hughes but in the meantime the matter of the bequest assumed for her constantly greater proportions after some time had passed she ventured to mention it again he answered as before i can't afford it she knew that he could afford it about the same time he bought a strip of ground lying beside them and began his garden rachel suggested that he take a piece of their own grounds but he bluntly rejected the proposal a growing taciturnity marked his manner and often a willful crudeness of phrase and speech which annoyed her almost to the point of reproof so far as was possible however she kept the recognition of all this far in the background of her thought and forbore any conscious criticism of him even to herself but her warmest feeling for him was tinged with pity yesterday he had been taken this accident sudden as a lightning flash and more unforeseen had ended the relation between them though not the puzzle rachel had never been one to revise her opinion of a man because he was dead her tears had fallen now but she had no compunctious self-deception and her long-framed feelings were only complicated not really altered she saw as clearly as ever the incongruity of her husband's presence in this room where richard hughes had had his life and where she now had her own part three all waited for the coming of john's brother david marquis david was an elder brother retired from business on some pretext or other now loitering his way profitably and pleasantly through the latter half of his life it had been his custom to visit them frequently spending weeks at a time idling about the house quiet keen of look ready to talk with interest on any general topic but incommunicative of opinion on any personal matter rachel had always felt as she saw his observant eye first upon john and then upon her that he saw the difference between them and sympathized with her for this reason although she had never criticized john to him she had sometimes spoken freely of herself and of her own tastes and wishes and he had listened quietly as ever but responsively she had a sort of feeling now that she would find her poise through him when he came a sympathetic eye would help her to adjust the degree of her grief to the limits of her previous feeling it was eight o'clock when he arrived the pretext of dinner in the house was over and even the neighborly and professional attentions of the day were withdrawn rachel descended from her room in the quiet house at the sound of his entrance and met gratefully the brotherly kindliness of his manner they sat a few minutes in the hall in question and answer of his journey and of the accident and all the circumstantial things which cluster about death itself rachel answered freely and fully discovering a relief in breaking the instinctive repression of the day and finding the sort of rest she had hoped for from his presence david listened to her quietly as he had always done with his ready eye upon her at last he rose turning away from her with a comprehensive look about him where is he he asked abruptly in the library said rachel with a movement to lead the way for him in there exclaimed david with the emphasis of surprise 
then he closed his lips again and followed her, without meeting her questioning look. But inside the door he paused again. Rachel had, constrained by long habit, looked first at the room as she entered, and then at the casket, as a separate thing. The room had so long served to give her poise that she felt a sort of appeal to it, even now. David's eyes rested first on the casket, and then swept the room in a disapproving look. "'Why is he here?' he asked, with a curtness in his easy voice, which Rachel had never heard from him before. "'Why,' she began hesitatingly, and then added vaguely, "'it seemed best.' "'Best for him?' responded David, with the same curtness. Then he turned and dropped his head slowly over the figure in the coffin, and Rachel slipped away. David's manner seemed to put her entirely outside of the occasion. Later he joined her where she waited for him in the dim parlor. The still chilliness of the room was stiffening and depressing, but she had not made a fire because its open cheerfulness would not have seemed appropriate. David walked up and down the long room a few minutes in silence, which Rachel, not knowing his mood, did not break. Then he said, as abruptly as before, "'Can you have him moved in the morning?' moved where rachel had not supposed that her brother-in-law would have the same feeling of incongruity that she had anywhere but there here i don't know there is no place in the house that seems to belong to him the hall might do at least he went through there every day he finished with an irony none too subtle he began to walk up and down the length of the room alternately facing her with a challenging air and turning abruptly away again when he had neared her seat. But Rachel, absorbed still in her mood, was unappreciative of his manner. John never fitted into the house very well anywhere, she said, with reserved regret. Fitted into it, exclaimed David, as he turned toward her at the end of the room. My, did the house ever fit into him? It is the business of a house to suit the people that live in it, he flung over his shoulder as he wheeled away again. Rachel was silent, puzzled at this surprising change of manner in David, and not knowing how much of his emotion was merely the impatience of grief. Is there a corner of the house where it is appropriate for him to lie now, except the little cubbyhole of his upstairs? demanded David, continuing, but as one who knows that an answer is impossible. He suddenly abandoned his walk and came over and sat down opposite her, in front of the empty fireplace. He sat silent a moment, his gray figure drooping in the big chair. Rachel, looking carefully at him for the first time, noted with a kind of surprise the mark of brokenness and relaxation upon him, of submission to tremendous grief. It had not occurred to her that John could be mourned in that way. After a moment he said quietly, "'This house has never been a home for John.' I was always hoping, said Rachel, as if this subject were one which they had discussed before and agreed upon, that he would feel more at home here in time. What would have been necessary to bring that about? David asked quietly. Well, said Rachel, with reluctance and criticism even greater than usual, he would have had to change in many ways. In what ways? persisted David. Rachel hesitated again. The thing, when baldly said, seemed so much harsher than when it was merely held in thought. John's taste was different from that of the people who made this house, she said. Yes, I know. These pictures and the old books in the library and so on. Is that what you mean? Well, the insides of the books and other pictures which we don't have and so on, she finished indefinitely. Yes, you thought John was crude and rather coarse of feeling. Oh, no, not that, indeed. You wouldn't call it just that, of course, but the difference between you was the same, whether it put you up high or him down low. Isn't that so? You were sorry for yourself because John was not on your level. Yes, admitted Rachel, reluctantly voicing the words. Were you ever sorry enough for John because you were not on his level? There are different kinds of lonesomeness, he added after a pause. I never saw a worse case than John's. Rachel sat upright, looking at him in a sort of amazement, as much at himself as at the idea. 
she had never dreamed that behind his apparently sympathetic observation of her lay any condemnation of her attitude he met her look with one as direct and asked in a way which made the question a sort of arraignment did it ever occur to you what a tragedy john's life was rachel merely shook her head slowly as she tried to connect in an impersonal sort of way the notion of tragedy with john john the successful the obstinate the simple in desire the objective there had been no real disappointment in all his life she looked back half indignantly at david rejecting the suggestion david rose and took a turn up and down the parlor again pausing in the shadows at the farther end of the room then he came back to his seat and faced her determinedly what i had always hoped was that you would come to understand john without any outside interference i came back over and over to see but i always kept from butting in he paused again i wouldn't say anything now only your tone your poor john way shows you are just the same as ever i won't have him buried without your knowing something more about him if i could show you he added more gently please tell me said rachel quietly her mind was still half as much on david as on what he was going to say there is nothing to tell that you should not have seen for yourself you were his wife and you lived with him from the time you came to this house one side of john's life ended in a way he had no home and no wife a man wants a companion rachel almost spoke in startled contradiction it was she who had been uncompanioned you were proud i know of never finding fault with john don't you know that he would have been glad if you had openly found fault with him as it was it seemed as if you thought him hopeless when he said things about the house or anything in it he really wanted you to contradict him and argue with him and give him a way to come to the same place where you were don't you see did he tell you no but of course i used to sit around with him a good deal and i had always been used to understanding him he added with a drop in his voice john had a lot of imagination he went on rachel looked up in real surprise i could see every year how the house was getting more on his nerves sometimes when he was feeling it more than usual he would say little things that i understood for him it was like living with someone who didn't want him around but he might have liked it you don't understand said rachel as if pricked into coming to her own defense john didn't like the way the house came to us in the first place you didn't know yes i did he responded as she hesitated i found out and yet she went on we used the house and the money you haven't known much about the business for several years have you of course you do know that the house has been in your name from the beginning almost but you don't know that the few thousand richard hughes left have been invested for you ever since two years after he died it crippled john for a while after he took it out of the business but he always took good care of that money it amounts to quite a little now john didn't like it because richard rachel hesitated again you thought he was jealous he did that after one day when you weeded out a lot of his books and put them away in some corner and it was after he had those new york electric men here that evening and you seemed not to want to have them in the library that he bought the corner of ground over there and made his garden don't you understand rachel dropped her face upon her hands partly for relief from david's serious face which forbore to rebuke her and yet of necessity did so partly to close herself in with her own bewilderment to reconstruct john's life meant to take a new view of her own also david leaned suddenly toward her if john had been jealous wouldn't he have had a reason rachel i know you weren't untrue to him but still he felt the formulation of the thought with her i haven't judged you harshly rachel he went on in a moment but it is not right that a man's brother should know him better than his wife does i had to make you know even at the last then as if he were compelled to say the final hard thing he added wasn't there something you had already thought you should do when everything was in your hands rachel startled and flushing faced him again in involuntary confession i had always thought it would be right to carry out a plan of richard hughes's 
yes i know i am sure that was only a momentary notion of his he had a great habit of making notes of things his will was made only a few days before he died and that idea was probably earlier i was an executor you remember but anyway, several years ago, John made a large gift to the library of Richard's College in Richard's name. He took no chances on being unfair. He should have told you, he added, but John had a hard sort of pride to manage, and I suppose he never did. No, said Rachel, he never did. She rose with a sudden dropping of her hands at her sides, as if relinquishing something they had held, and moved vaguely toward the door. "'Don't you think,' pursued David, "'that he might be brought in here, or somewhere?' Rachel hesitated, her hand faltering on the doorframe. "'No,' she said at last, "'let him stay there now.' And she herself went out through the dim, chill hall. She lingered a moment at the closed library door, and then went slowly on up to her own empty room. End of story Biographical and Interpretive Notes by Editor Charles Swain Thomas Margaret Lynn, member of the English Department of the State University of Kansas at Lawrence, is best known for her sympathetic appreciation of prairie life. This story is a tragedy, the tragedy of a wife's failure to understand the finer side of her husband's nature. She learns her misjudgment all too late, when the husband lies dead. The emotional values are the greater because the reader inevitably contemplates the long years they lived together in their isolation. The psychology of the situation is portrayed with remarkable clarity. The method is very different from the method of such writers as de Maupassant. De Maupassant's analysis and dissecting is usually done with cold and relentless indifference. Miss Lynn's processes are here carried out determinedly, but with full and lingering sympathy. End of section 21. Section 22 of Atlantic Narratives Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Water and the Spirit by Margaret Prescott Montague I want to tell you. I must tell you all about it. With a kind of grave finality, the little woman on the deck chair next to mine snapped together the collapsible drinking cup with which she had been playing and sat up, laying a small eager hand on my arm. It was as if her groping thoughts had suddenly pushed open a door into action. I wondered if she guessed that I had been peeping at her from under dropped lids. She had the colorless makeup of a small middle-aged mouse, but her expression was amazing. It startled and arrested one. All the old lines of the face were set to small ambitions and sordid desires, but the look which should have accompanied these lines was clean gone wiped into something big and still and simple, and her manner was that of an earnest child. I was in Belgium when it commenced, she began, but I guess I'd better go back and tell it all right from the beginning, she broke off. Please do, I begged. I did my best to speak naturally, but my voice seemed to break some spell, for her face blurred suddenly to self-consciousness. I, I reckon I ought to apologize for speaking to a stranger, she stammered primly, and now her words exactly matched all the old small lines of her face. It was as if her little self, aware of something big and overwhelming that threatened to sweep her out of her depth, made a desperate clutch at conventionality. But I want to hear, I protested eagerly, please tell me. She must have seen that I was in earnest, for the little conventional self disappeared at that, and she answered simply, "'And I want to tell you. It seems like I've just got to tell you.' It was September, 1914. We homing Americans were churning through an extraordinarily blue ocean toward New York and peace, while back there, just over our shoulders, a mad world was running red. It was like being torn all to pieces and put together again different she said 
But I'll go back, like I said, and start right from the beginning. For a moment she was silent, staring thoughtfully down at the cheap little metal cup screwing the ring softly round and round, and drawing, as it were, inspiration from the sight of it. I come from Johnson's Falls, she began at length. You wouldn't know where that is. It's just a little place down in West Virginia. But it's right close to the Virginia state line, and we have some mighty nice people in town. Why, she exclaimed, I reckon we have some of the very best blood in the South there. But, but that isn't what I set out to tell you, she caught herself up. She fell into such a prolonged silence, turning the little cup and looking at it, that at last I ventured a question to start her again. "'And I suppose,' I said, "'you belong to one of the oldest families there.' I was sorry as soon as I had said it. "'No, I don't,' she answered simply, looking straight up at me. That was how it all commenced. My father kept the livery stable, but of course it wouldn't matter, keeping a livery, I mean, if your family was all right. Jeff Randolph kept the grocery. Being a Randolph, of course, he could. But my name's Smithson, Sadie Virginia Smithson, and my grandfather was a carpenter. I'm a dressmaker myself. That's the reason they didn't elect me to the Laurel Literary Society. She paused a moment. I reckon you wouldn't understand about the Laurel Literary Society? She questioned a trifle wistfully. Perhaps not, I admitted. Well, it's a literary society, of course. The members read papers and all like that, but it's a heap more than that. Belonging to it kind of marks a person out in Johnson's Falls and gives them the, the, well, I'd reckon you call it the entree to all the best homes in town. If you don't belong, well, I reckon it came kind of hard on me not belonging than it did on some of the others. Why, well, I'd have said the girls that started it were my very best friends. We'd played together as children, and I called them all by their first names, and they knew I was just as smart and liked reading and all that just as well as any of them did. So when I wasn't asked to join, well, it just seemed to knock me right out. I wasn't but nineteen then, and when your young things hurt more, I reckon. Anyhow, the slight of it got just fixed in my mind, and I kind of made a vow that I'd belong to that society some day if I died for it. And then, after a while, it came to me, maybe if I could just save money enough to go abroad, they'd ask me to read a paper before the society when I got back, cause mighty few people have travelled much from our town. Well, she looked thoughtfully away at the blue water. Many and many a night I've put myself to sleep thinking how it would be when I read that paper. You know, when you're young and kind of unhappy and slighted, how you make up things to sort of comfort yourself? I nodded. Well, I could just see the whole thing, me standing there reading and all, and when I'd get through I could almost hear the applause. They'd some of them have on gloves, you know, so it would sound softer and more genteel-like than just common bare-handed clapping. Well, it takes time for a country dressmaker to save. It took me twenty years. I did have most enough once, but then my sister was taken sick, and what I'd saved had to go for her, but I just gritted my teeth and commenced again. And at last, this spring, I had enough, and I joined a party and went. I was wasn't a regular party. It was just a professor and his wife who were going anyhow, and would take a couple of ladies with them, so there were just the four of us. Well, we traveled for a month or more, and you better believe I stretched my eyes to see all there was to see. And then, all at once, the world just tipped itself right over and went crazy. We were in Brussels when it came. The professor was sure everything would quiet down in a little bit, and he said we'd better stay right there. And anyhow, it wasn't easy to get away. It was all just awful, with one country after another slipping in. Only things came so quick, a person didn't have hardly time to catch their breath and think how awful, for something worse was jumping right on top of it. Well, we stayed and stayed till at last the Germans came. It certainly was a sight to see em, But I ain't going to tell about that. I'm just going to skip right along to what I set out to tell. The professor and his wife had left their only child, a mighty sickly little thing, with her grandmother in Paris, and when things got so bad they were pretty near distracted to get to her. Well, one morning the professor came in and told us he'd run across a young American, 
a Mr. Grenville, who was being sent to Paris on some special diplomatic business. He had a big automobile, and he thought maybe he could get it fixed to take us all, too. It looked like a mighty crazy thing to do, but there wasn't any holding the professor and his wife on account of their child. And me and the other lady, we was afraid to be left behind. Well, after a lot of running around from one official to another, they did finally get it all fixed for us to go, and the next day we started out with an American flag on the front of our car. Of course we were stopped a lot of times, and all our papers gone through and everything, but each time they let us go on account of Mr. Grenville being a United States official. We'd started early, and by noon we'd come a right smart piece, and about that time we began to hear firing on in front. Did you ever hear them big guns? She broke off to ask, her childlike eyes questioning me. I shook my head. Well, you needn't never want to hear em, she said. When they commenced, we all kind of looked at one another, and I reckon we was all scared. Anyhow, I know I was. Why, at home I'm afraid of a thunderstorm. But still we kept on. The sound of the firing got louder and louder, but it was never very close, and long late in the afternoon it sort of died off, and we commenced to draw breath again and think everything was going to be all right. I'm most sure now we must have missed the way, for just about that time we ran upon a piece of road that was all tore up. There were big holes in it from the shells, and those tall poplars alongside were all snapped off, and their branches stripped down like a child peels a switch. You could smell the fresh sap like you can in lumber camps at home. Well, we had to slow up and kind of pick our way, and on round the very next turn we ran right up on them. On the fighting, I gasped. No, no, the fight was all over then. Just for a flash coming on em so quick like I didn't know what they were. They looked like little sprawled brown heaps. But in the second I was wondering, one of em flung up an arm and groaned. How awful, I cried aghast. Yes, she assented simply. It certainly was awful. My words ain't big enough to tell you how awful. Running up on em so unexpected like that kind of cut my breath right off and choked me. There they were, lying all about across the road and in a wheat field alongside, with the sun just shining down like it was any kind of a summer day. A good many of em were dead, but there were a plenty that weren't. They blocked the road so we had to stop, and right where we stopped there was a young man lying flung over on his back. He'd snatched his shirt open at the breast, and the blood had all dripped down into the dust of the road. He opened his eyes and stared right up in my face and cried, Water, for God's sake. He said it over and over in the awfulest voice, and like it was one word, Water, for God's sake, water, for God's sake, like that. I had this little drinking cup, and there was a good-sized creek, just a piece across the field, so I grabbed my handbag and jumped out. <laughs> well, at that, all of them in the car commenced to holler and scream at me to get back. Though we couldn't stop, it wouldn't be safe, and we couldn't do anything. And anyhow, the stretcher bearers would be along directly. But I just said, He wants water, and I've got my cup here. And there's the branch. And anyhow, I says, He looks kind of like my sister's oldest boy. And with that, I started on to the creek. Well, the professor and Mr. Grenville jumped out of the car and came running after me, but I just turned round and looked at them. You all go on, I says. He asked me for water, for God's sake, and if you try and put me back in that car, I'll fight you like a wildcat. I never did anything like that. Fightin', I mean, she broke off to explain earnestly. But I would have, and I reckon they knew it. The professor tried to argue. You'll be a raving maniac if you stay here, he says. Well, I says, look what's here now. What difference does it make if I am? Somehow that was the way I felt. Everything was so awful it didn't seem to matter whether anything awful happened to me or not. So I just kept on to the creek, and Mr. Grenville said, "'For heaven's sake, let her stay if she can do anything. I wish to God I could stay, too.' But he couldn't. He was carrying some mighty important dispatches that he just had to get on with. And then he calls out to me, "'Good luck and God bless you, Miss Smithson.' And when I looked back, he was standing with his hat off. He was a mighty nice young man." But all the time the other ladies in the car was screaming and hollering for them to come on, so they had to go. They left you all alone? I cried. They had to, she returned. 
Mr. Grenville had to get on with his dispatches, and it was the last chance the professor and his wife had of getting through to their child. And the other lady, well, she couldn't do nothing but scream anyhow. By the time I was coming back from the creek, the car was just pulling out of sight. Somehow, to see it go like that gave me a kind of funny feeling. I was scared, I reckon, but all the same I felt kind of still, too. It seemed like for the last few weeks I'd been hustled along in a wild kind of torrent. But now I'd touched bottom and got my feet under me. I reckon a woman does touch bottom when there's anything she can do. Anyhow, one raised to work like I've been does. But, oh, my Lord, she cried suddenly, dropping her face to her hands. I wish I could keep from seeing it all still, and hearing it too. Did you ever hear a man scream, she demanded, not just groan, but shriek and scream? In hospitals, I said uncertainly. I've heard people screaming when they were coming out of ether. She shook her head. That's different. You knew there were people, nurses and doctors, to do things for them. But out there there wasn't anything but the trampled wheat and the big empty sky. There was plenty of them who wanted water and begged and cried for it, but I just said, I'll be back to you all presently, and went on to the first one. He was kind of delirious, but he could drink the water and was mighty glad to get it. I brushed the flies all away and spread a clean handkerchief over his wound. He was too far gone to try and do anything else for him, and went on back to the creek. Water, that was the main thing they wanted. The most of them that could be were bandaged already. Some of the medical outfit had been around and got em tied up, but after that I reckon the fighting must have changed and cut em off from their friends, but the stretcher bears didn't come and didn't come. It was all so strange and kind of shut away there like destruction and lit for a spell and then flown on to the next place. The wheat was all laid over and tramped, lumpy with khaki bodies and with caps and guns and things flung around in it, and the red sun sailing down and down in the west, and every here and there awful splatters of blood in the wheat. But I didn't have time to look and think too much, and it was mighty lucky I didn't have. They were all English, and had run upon a German battery, and had been shot to pieces for they hardly knew what was happening. I guess some of them must have got away, but there was a plenty that didn't. They had been lying there since dawn, and, and they were hungry, her voice broke, and I didn't have anything to give them, she whispered. They say after a while you get kind of numb to things, she went on presently with her grave simplicity. I don't know how that is, but I know the things I saw made me stop every now and then down by the creek out of sight, and just ring and wring my hands together in a kind of rage of pity. Once, going through the wheat, I tramped on something soft, and when I looked, it was, it was just a piece of a man. I thought I'd lay right down then and die, but I says to myself, they want water, they want water, and that way I kind of drove myself on. But all the time I could see my heart under my waist just jumping up and down like I was fighting to jump out and run away. And then another time... But she broke off. No, she said. I won't tell about that. It's so peaceful here with that blue water and sunshine and all. I reckon I oughtn't to tell what it's like underneath when hell takes the lid off. And maybe some day the Lord'll let me forget. But it's funny, she went on again presently, how your mind grabs a hold of any foolish thing to steady you. She paused, staring down at the little cup as though she drew remembrance from it. I recollect as I went back and forth, back and forth, weaving out paths through the wheat, a silly song that we used to sing to a game at school kept running in my head. I don't want none of your weevily wheat, and I don't want none of your barley. "'and I don't want none of your weevily wheat to bake a cake for Charlie. "'I was mighty glad it did, for all it was so silly. It "'Kept me from flying right off the handle. "'And so I kept on and on carrying him water. "'Some of the men thought it was funny I should be there, "'and they wanted to talk and ask me questions. "'But the most of them were suffering too bad to care, "'and some of them were busy going along into the next world "'and were done with being surprised over anything in this.' Most of them called me nurse, or sister, and some way I liked to have them do it. Some of them certainly were brave, too. 
why i saw one young fella jump straight up to his feet and fling his arms out wide and holler right up at the sky are we downhearted no and pitch over dead you know she paused to explain simply her extraordinarily childlike eyes lifted to mine for understanding and sympathy it just seemed to snatch the heart right out of you to see a person stand up to death like that especially when they're so young like that little fella of course she went on after a moment i didn't just give him water i'd do any other little thing i could besides and every time i could do anything i certainly was glad doing things seemed to ease up a little that terrible rage of pity i felt i took my skirt off and rolled it up for a pillow for a little fellow who couldn't move and was laying with his head in a kind of sinkhole he tried to thank me but he couldn't he just sobbed but he caught a hold of my hand and kissed it that made me cry it was so sort of young and pretty of him after that i went on for a spell with the tears just pouring down my cheeks but presently i found the one who couldn't drink the water and i quit crying then my tears weren't big enough only gods would have been big enough for that the man's face was all gone eyes mouth everything and still he was alive he must have heard me and known somebody was there for he commenced to scream and moan trying to say things down in his throat and to reach out his hands and flop about oh my god it was like a chicken with its head off i thought i'd have to run but i didn't i just sort of fell down beside him and caught hold of his hands and patted them and talked to him like you do to a child in a nightmare i don't know what i said at first just a crazy jumble of pity i reckon but after a little bit i found i was praying i know i needed it and it seemed to help him too for after a little bit he stopped that awful trying to speak down in his throat and lay still just gripping my hands i was so crazy i couldn't think of a thing to say but god bless us and keep us and make his face to shine upon us and be merciful unto us and i just said that over and over i guess it wasn't the words that he wanted it was the feeling of having god there in all that awful dark and blood and some human being beside him who was sorry anyhow every time i'd stop he'd snatch at my wrist so hard it would hurt look she broke off to push up her gray sleeve and there on her thin wrist still vividly black and blue were the bruised prints of fingers but i was glad to be hurt i wanted to be hurt i wanted to have a share in all the suffering it just seemed like my heart would break and she added with great simplicity i reckon that's just what it did do for i know i broke through into something bigger than i ever had been well after a while god did have mercy on that poor soul for he quit pulling up my hands and began to die and when i came round again to him he was gone but that got me started and i left off saying that foolishness about the weevilly wheat and said the little prayer instead i said it to myself first but after a little bit i found i was saying it out loud i don't know why but it just seemed like i had to say it every time i gave one of them water just god bless us and keep us and make his face to shine upon us and be merciful unto us it was somehow like a child's game like having to touch every tree box going along the street or stepping over every crack each one of them had to have the water and the little prayer and then on to the next or back down to the creek for more most of them didn't seem to notice but some of them laughed and some stared like i was crazy maybe i was a little and again some of them were glad of it so i kept on and on and the sun went down and the dark came and it seemed like a kind of a lid had shut us away from all the world it wasn't right dark but the stars were shining it was about that time that i found the little officer he was dying off in the wheat all to himself and he got me to take down some messages for his folks i wrote em in my diary i had a pocket flashlight in my bag and it made a round eye of light that stared out at every word i wrote they were the simplest kind of words just love love to mother and love to father and snippy and peg and good-bye to em all and how he was glad to die for england but they look mighty strange jumping about there in my diary alongside of travel notes about brussels 
as like something big and terrible had smashed its fist right through all the little fancy things. But it was funny, she went on after a minute, how sort of like little children so many of the men were, so trusting and helpless. There was one little fellow always said the same thing to me every time I came round. They'll sure be around for us soon now, won't they, sister, he'd say. And I'd always answer, oh yes, just in a little bit now. And he'd settle back again, so trusting and satisfied and like I really knew. That was the way they all seemed to me, just children. Even the ones that cursed and screamed at me. Another funny thing, she added, lifting her grave child eyes to mine. I've never been married. Never knew what it was to have children. But that night, all those men were my children. Even the biggest and roughest of them. I felt them all here. She held her hands tight against her breast. And I believe I would have died for any one of them. I reckon being so crazy with pity had stretched me up out of being a kind of scary old maid into being a mother. I recollect there were two loose horses galloping about. They were wild with fear, and they'd gallop as hard as ever they could in one direction, and then they'd wheel round and come to a stand with their heads up and their tails cocked and nicker, and snort over what they smelt, and then take out again. Well, once they came charging right down on us, and I thought sure they were going right over the men. I never stopped to think. I ran straight out in front of them, waving my arms and hollering. They just missed galloping right over me, but I didn't care. I believe I'd almost have been glad. It was like I said. I wanted to be hurt, too. That was because it was all so lonesome for him. Death and suffering is a lonesome thing, she stated gravely. When they'd scream, I felt like I'd tear my heart out to help him. But all I could do was just stand on the outside like and watch him suffering and maybe drying inside there all alone. That's why it seemed like being hurt, too, would make it easier. But along late in the night the guns broke out again awful loud, and presently off against the sky I saw red streaks of flame go up in two places, and I knew there were towns on fire. I just stopped still and looked and thought what it was like with the folks scurrying round like rats, and the fire and the shells raining down on them. That's hell, right over there, I says out loud to myself, and then I went on down to the creek faster than ever. Maybe I was getting kind of light-headed then, and God knows it was enough to make anybody so. Anyhow, I felt like I had to hold hell back. It was loose right over there, and the only thing that held it off was the cup of water and the little prayer. So I kept on back and forth, back and forth from the creek faster and faster. I thought if I missed one of them it would let hell in on all the rest, so I kept on and on. The guns were booming and the flames going up into the sky, and all hell was loose. But the little prayer and the cup of water was holding it back. And then at last, when it commenced to freshen for dawn, I knew I'd won. She drew a deep breath and paused, looking up at me with clear, faraway eyes. That was because I knew he was there, she said. He, I questioned, awestruck by her tone. She nodded. Yes, God, she answered simply. And after that, that terrible lonesomeness melted all away. I knew that though I had to stand outside and see him suffer, he was inside there with him, closer to him than they ever was to themselves. So I know it wasn't really lonesome for him, even if they were suffering and dying. And I'm right sure that a good many of them got to know that too. Anyhow, the faces of some of the ones that had died looked that way when I saw them in the morning. Maybe it was because I cared so much myself that I kind of broke through into knowing how much more God cared. Folks always talk like he was a father way off in the sky. But I got to know that night that what was really God was something big and close, right in your own heart. There was a heap more like a big mother. And it was all bigger and sort of simpler than I'd ever thought it would be. Right over there was hell and big guns and men killing each other. But here where we were, were just stars overhead. And folks that you could do things for and God. I reckon that's the way, she said with her grave simplicity. When things get too awful, you suffer through to God. 
and he turns you back to the simplest things. Just the little prayer and the cup of water for men that was like sick children. This is the cup, she added, holding it out for my inspection. And, and that's all, I reckon, she concluded. When daylight came, the stretcher bearers did get through to us. There was a sort of doctor officer with him, and I never in my life saw anyone look so tired. "'Who are you, and what in thunder are you doing here?' he stormed out at me. Only I don't say it as strong as he did. I reckon I must have looked like a wild woman. I'd lost my hat, and my hair was all falling down, and I only had on my short alpaca underskirt, cause I'd taken off my dress skirt to make a pillow, like I'd said. But I just stood right up in the midst of all those poor bodies, and says— I'm Miss Smithson, Sadie Virginia Smithson, and I've been holding hell back all night. I knew I was talking crazy, but I didn't care, like the way you do coming out of ether. He stared at me for a spell, and then he says, kind of funny, Well, Miss Sadie Virginia, I'm glad you held some of it back, for everybody else in the world was letting it loose that night. He was mighty kind to me, though, and helped get me to one of the base hospitals, and from there over to England. But I don't know what happened to the professor and his party. Well, I ventured after a long pause, and not knowing quite what to say, the Laurel Literary Society will be glad enough to have you belong to it now. She flashed bolt upright at that, her eyes staring at me. But, but you don't understand, she cried breathlessly. I've been face to face with war and death and hell and God. I've been born again. Do you reckon any of them little old things matter now? I was stunned by the white look of her face. What does matter now? I whispered at last. Nothing, she answered. Nothing but God and love and doing things for folks. That was why I had to tell you. End of story. Biographical and Interpretive Notes by Charles Swain Thomas Margaret P. Montague, living among the West Virginia mountains, has written many successful stories of the hill people whom she knows so well. The chain of incidents narrated by the simple-hearted Virginia dressmaker is of absorbing interest, and seems to be the real experiences of one who had actually endured the tragedy of having lived in the horror of the aftermath of battle. But even more interesting than these scenes of pitiful suffering is the effect produced upon the woman who endures it all. Her whole attitude toward life was changed. What matters it now that her father was not an aristocratic Virginian? What if she were a poor dressmaker at the little village of Johnson's Falls? What, though she was not elected a member of the Laurel Literary Society? She had been face to face with war and death and hell and God— the little things of life had unconsciously sunk away, and the great enduring themes had boldly emerged to recreate her spiritual self. End of section. Section 23 of Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mr. Squem by Arthur Russell Taylor Why do we go on perpetuating an uncomfortable breed? The man who was shaving at the mirror-paneled door of the Pullman smoking compartment looked at his questioner on the leather seat opposite. Give it up, he answered. Why is a hen? The first man wrapped his pipe empty on the edge of a cuspidor. You answer the question, he said, in the only possible way, by asking another. Right, answered the shaver, and began to run the hot water. A closely built man, in a suit so heavily striped as to seem stripes before it was a suit, lurched into the compartment and settled himself to his paper and cigar. That monkey on a stick, he presently broke out, is still taking good money away from the asses who go to hear him rant about God and hell and all the rest up in Boston. I am so damn tired of him and of that rich, rough-necked freeze. It's the limit. Pretty much, said the man with the pipe. 
I was reading about the Belgians just before you came in, and when I jumped away from them I lit on something about Poland. Then I wondered aloud to this gentleman why we go on multiplying, increasing such an uncomfortable breed. Modic gods and degenerate millionaires make one wonder more. "'What is your line, may I ask?' inquired the stripe-suited man. "'Religion.' "'The hell, I beg your pardon. If you mean that you're a preacher or something like that, all I've got to say is you're a funny one. It's your job, isn't it, to be dead sure that everything's all right, or somehow going to be all right, no matter about all the must-upness? Yes, that's certainly your job. Yet here you are, asking why we go on stocking the world with kids. I might ask that. I'm in rubber tires, but not you. Yes, I might. Only I don't.' The man who had been shaving had resumed his tie, collar, and coat, and now lighted a cigarette. "'I lay my money,' he said, "'on one thing, that if men let themselves go, they wind up shortly with God, or with what would be God if there were any. You've come to it early, through the ledger. You'd have got to it sooner or later, though, if you'd been talking about hunting dogs, provided you'd have let yourselves go.' "'Well, now,' asked the closely built man, what is your line? Education. High-brow company. Seems to me the pair of you ought to be silencers for a plain business man like me. Rubber is my line, not how the world is run. My opinion on that is small change, sure. Yet I think it ought to be run, the world, I mean, even if it's mussed up to the limit, and I think it's up to us to keep it running. The parson here, if he is a parson, asks why we should, that is, if I get him, and then I think there's a manager of it all in the central office. A manager, understand, though he never seems to show up around the works, and certainly does seem to have some of the darndest ways. The professor here, if he is a professor, doesn't sense any manager. That is, if I get him straight, with his if there were any. That was what you said, wasn't it? I'm a pick chicken on religion and education, but honest. Both those ideas would mean soft tires for me, "'Yes, sir, soft tires. "'Broad Street, gentlemen,' said the porter at the door. "'The Reverend Alan Dare walked away from the train and down the street. "'He was episcopally faced and episcopally trim, "'and he was having considerable difficulty in holding his universe together. "'This is not pleasant at forty-two, "'when you want your universe held together and things settled and calm. He had an uncomfortable sense that this difficulty had jolted into plain sight on the car. "'Ass,' he addressed himself briefly, "'to let your sag and unsettlement loose in that way, "'to say such a thing as you said, and in such a place, "'to parade your momentary distrust of life. "'Ass, oh, ass!' He said, or thought, a prayer-book collect, one which seemed rather suited to asses, and continued— I suppose I'm three-tenths sag, no more, and he knoweth whereof we are made, and what a devil of a world it is to be in just now. But that rubber man on the car, he isn't sag at all. Heavens, his crudeness, his beastly clothes, and the bare-shaved welt around the back of his neck, and that awful seal ring. But he's fastened. Life is worth pushing at and cheering for, and there's a manager. If he has the darndest ways— I'd give something for an every-minute mood like that, a carrying night and day sureness like that. He's not illuminated, lucky dog. Professor William Emery Brown had changed cars, and was continuing his journey. In his lap lay a volume of essays just put forth by a member of his craft, a college professor. He opened it. It chanced at page twenty-seven, and his eye was caught by the name of his own speciality. He read— Philosophy is the science which proves that we can know nothing of the soul. Medicine is the science which tells us that we know nothing of the body. Political economy is that which teaches that we know nothing of the laws of wealth, and theology the critical history of those errors from which we deduce our ignorance of God. Confound it! ejaculated Professor Brown, and closed the book. Room for one more? inquired a voice, and the rubber tire man slid into the seat. "'I just pulled off a little thing out there,' he said, "'that ought to put a small star in my crown. A down and out, a tough looker, says to me, "'Please, mister, give me a dime. I'm hungry.' And I says to him, "'Get out. What you want is a good drink. Go get it.' And slips him a quarter. Talk about gratitude. 
to think there are men, you know it and I know it, and he was afraid of it, who'd have steered him to a quick lunch and put him against soft-boiled eggs. Man's inhumanity to man. Sure, nothing but that ever makes me any trouble about things. Terra ninety, George, this to the conductor, and burn this pantella some time. You said you were in education, he went on. I've just blown myself to a universal history. Five big volumes with lots of maps and pictures and flags of all nations and hanging gardens of Babylon and such things. Gave down thirty-five for it, and my name is printed Peter B. Squem on the first page of every book. Now, Mr. Squem grew quite earnest, you'd say, wouldn't you, that if a man could take those books down, chew them up, you understand, and take them down, he'd have an education? Not the same, of course, as normal school or college, and yet an education. I think, if you know what's good for you, you will steer clear of what you call an education. I think I should stick to rubber tires, and a few comfortable certainties, and peace. Mr. Squem stared. How's that? he inquired. Education is your line, you were saying, and yet you queer your stuff? I'd get a quick word from the house if I handled mercury tires that way. But you wouldn't, rejoined Professor Brown. You wouldn't because tires mean something. Tires are your life preserver. They are shaped like life preservers, aren't they? You've got me going, said Mr. Squem, and no mistake. I don't mind telling you I'd hope to get some hunch from you, on education. You see, my clothes are right. I always have a room with a bath, and I get two hundred a month and fifty on the side. I read the papers and the magazine section on Sunday— and I got through four books last year, and yet there's something not there. By Kiefer, not there. I'd give something to get it there, to slide it under somehow and bring the rest of me up to regular manicuring and ice cream forks and the way my clothes fit. Mr. Squem was interrupted in the expression of this craving. There was a tremendous jar. The car tore and bumped with an immense pounding over the ties, then careened and sprawled down a short bank and settled on its side. People who have been through such an experience will require no description. To others none can be given. In the bedlam, chaos, and jumble, and chorus of shrieks and smashing glass, Professor Brown, struggling up through the bodies which had been hurled upon him, was conscious of a pain almost intolerably sharp in his leg, and then of a sort of striped whirlwind which seemed to be everywhere at once, extricating, calming, ordering, comforting, and swearing. It was like a machine-gun. "'Keep your clothes on. Nothing's gonna bite you. Just a little shake-up. Yes, chick, we'll find your ma. No, you don't climb over those people. Sit down or I'll help you. To hell with your valise. Pick up that child.' There go the axes. Everybody quiet now, just where he is. You with the side whiskers, get back. Back, you hear me? Now, children first, hand em along, women next, so, men last. Why didn't you say you was a doctor? Get out there quick. Some of those people have got broke and need you. Professor Brown was one of these last. Lifted by Peter Squem and a very scared brakeman, he lay on two Pullman mattresses at the side of the track, waiting for the rabbit-faced country doctor to reach him. He was suffering very much. It seemed to him that he had never really known pain before, but his attention went to a white-haired lady nearby, a slight, slender woman with breeding written all over her. She had made her way from the drawing-room of the Pullman and leaned heavily upon her maid in the state of approaching collapse. Professor Brown was impressed by her air of distinction even in the midst of his pain. Then he saw a striped arm supportingly encircle her, and a hand, dominated by an enormous seal-ring, pressed to her lips an open bottle of scotch. "'Let it trickle down, Auntie, right down. It's just what you need,' said Peter B. Squem. "'What did you think of when the car stopped rolling?' Professor Brown, lying in his bed, asked this question of Mr. Squem, sitting at its side. The latter had got the professor home to his house and his housekeeper after the accident the day before, and found the best surgeon in town and stood by while he worked, had in a dozen ways helped a bad business to go as well as possible, and now, having remained overnight, was awaiting the hour of his train. "'Think of nothing, no time.' I was that cross-eyed boy you've heard about, the one at the three-ringed circus. Did you see that newlywed rooster? I'll bet he was that 
the one with the celluloid collar. Goodbye, Maud, he yells, and then tries to butt himself through the roof. He wouldn't have left one sound rib in the car if I hadn't pinned him. No, I hadn't any time to think. He produced and consulted a watch, one that struck the professor as being almost too loud an ornament for a Christmas tree. An infant's face showed within as the case opened. "'Your baby?' inquired Professor Brown. "'Never. Not good enough. "'This kid I found, where do you suppose? "'On a picture postal at a newsstand. "'The picture was no good except the kid, and I cut him out, you see. "'Say, do you know the picture was painted by a man out in Montana? "'Yes, sir, Montana. "'They had the cards made over in Europe or somewhere. "'Dago's likely, and when they put his name on it, "'they didn't do a thing to that word Montana. "'Some spelling.' "'Why, what you have there,' said the professor, taking the watch with interest, "'is the holy child of Andrea Mantegna's circumcision. "'It's in the Uffizi at Florence. "'Singularly good it is, too. "'I'm very much wrapped up in the question, raised in a late book, "'of Mantegna's influence upon Giovanni Bellini. "'There's a rather fine point made in connection with another child in this same picture, "'a larger one pressing against his mother's knees.' Mr. Squem was perfectly uncomprehending. "'Come again?' he remarked. "'No, you needn't either, for I don't know anything about the rest of the picture. I told you it was no good. There was an old party in a funny bathrobe and with heavy Belshazzars, I remember. But the picture was this.' He rose and began to get into his overcoat. "'There's one thing about this kid,' he said in a casual tone, which somehow let earnestness through. "'I know a man.' He travels out of Philly, and he's some booze artist and other things that go along who's got one of those little Josephs, you know, those little dolls that Catholics tote around. Separate him from it? Not on your life. Why, he missed it one night on a sleeper, and he cussed and reared around and made the coon rout everybody out till he found it. It's luck, you see. Now this kid, Mr. Squam was pulling on his gloves, isn't luck, but he works like luck. He talks to me, understand, and here a pause. He puts all sorts of cussedness on the blink. You can't look at him and be an Indian. I was making the wrong sort of date in Trenton one day, and I saw him just in time. Sent the girl word I had been called out of town. I was figuring on the right time to pinch a man in the door. He'd done me dirty, and I saw him again. Good night. I'm never so punk that he doesn't ginger me. Doesn't look good to me. The management is mixed up with him, and I hook up to him. Here's the taxi. "'So long, Professor. Rats, I haven't done one little thing. Good luck to your game leg.' It was Sunday morning, and service was under way in the Church of the Holy Faith. For the thousandth time the Reverend Alan Dare had dearly beloved his people, assembled to the number of four hundred before him, exhorting them in such forthright English as cannot be written nowadays, not to dissemble nor cloak their sins before God, and to accompany him unto the throne of the heavenly grace.' He had had a sick feeling, as he read this exhortation, so full of pound, rhythm, heart-search, and splendid good sense, to the courteous abstractedness in the pews. Heavens, he had a thought, once this burnt in. He had wanted to shriek, or fire a pistol in the air, and then crush the meaning into his people, crush God into them, yes, and into himself. He was four-tenths sag that morning. The Reverend Alan Dare. In the Jubilate, a small choir boy, a phenomenon who was paid a thousand a year and was responsible for the presence of not a few of the four hundred, had sung, Be ye sure that the Lord he is God, to the ravishment of the congregation, not of the rector who stood looking dead ahead. The first lesson had been all about Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and drinking no wine, frightful ineptness. What could it mean to any one? How help any one? Here was life, with all its cruel tangles, tighter and more choking every day. Here was Arnold's darkling plain, and the confused alarms, and the ignorant armies clashing by night. There came back to Dare the creed that he had heard in the smoking compartment. I think it ought to be run, the world, even if it's must up to the limit, and I think it's up to us to keep it running. I think there's a manager of it all in the central office, a manager, understand, though he never seems to show up around the works, and certainly does seem to have some of the darndest ways. 
"'Oh, God,' breathed Alan Dare, "'there are so many things, so many things.' It was the same Sunday. Professor William Emery Brown was for the first time on crutches, and stood, supported by them, at his window. "'Back again,' he ruminated. "'I can probably drive to my classes in another week. Then the same old grind, showing ingenuous youth, who fortunately will not see it, how the search hath taught me that the search is vain. Ho, oh, hum! How very kind, that Mr. Squem! He did so much for me.' and how very funny i should like to produce him at the seminar with his just right clothes his dream of culture via his universal history his approach to reality through a picture postal card he turned on himself almost savagely then what the devil are you patronizing him for don't you see that he is hooked to something and you are not that he is warm and you are freezing that he is part of the wave the wave man and that you are just a miserable tossing clot it was the same sunday mr squem sat in his room extremely denish smitingly red as to walls oppressive with plush upholstery a huge deer head jutted from over the mantel divided honours with a highly coloured september morn affrontingly framed on a shelf stood a small bottle it contained a finger of mr squem amputated years before in alcohol on the knees of the owner of the room was volume one of the universal history number thirty two so red ink figures affirmed of a limited edition of five hundred sets mr squem's name was displayed in very large old english on the fly-leaf and above was an empty oval wherein his portrait might be placed no use soliloquized the owner of this treasure no use if i could chew it up and get it down or two of it that wouldn't slide under the thing that isn't there nothing will ever put me in the class of professor brown or that preacher on the car or bring the rest of me up to my clothes he rose and stretched maybe he said addressing a huge chocolate-coloured bust of an indian lady maybe i can catch up to those fellows some time but not here noon i bet looking at his watch and it is to eat he contemplated the mantegna baby so long he said you're running things and snapped his watch end of story biographical and interpretive notes by charles swain thomas rev arthur russell taylor rector of the episcopal church at york pennsylvania whose career as a writer of fiction opened so auspiciously with mr squem and a few companion stories died very suddenly early in january nineteen eighteen here the central interest is in character in creating such a personage as mr squem the writer of this story has boldly penetrated the veneer of culture and shown us that the character elements which are of enduring worth may be far aloof from any knowledge of art or religion or philosophy or any form of polite learning it is interesting to note the part which the railroad wreck plays in this story while there is enough in the situation to have made the wreck a point of central objective interest it is utilized here simply as the background for the display of mr squem genial direct efficient ingenious dominating interestingly crude in the february nineteen eighteen atlantic mr squem is equally interesting in a different environment soon after the death of rev arthur russell taylor bishop james henry darlington sent to the atlantic office as an interesting appreciation of dr taylor's work and character from bishop darlington we learn that dr taylor had for years been suffering from a tumour on the brain which had totally destroyed the sight of one eye and which by its pressure caused him constant pain sleepless nights and the gradual failing of the other eye like robert louis stevenson he was cheerful and brightened the lives of others until the very last and almost his final writings were sent to the atlantic end of section twenty three Introduction to Atlantic Narratives, Modern Short Stories, published 1918 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction by Charles Swain Thomas, editor of this volume of short stories. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Short Story there is a story current among companionable golfers of a countryman who reluctantly accepted an invitation from a group of friendly associates to try his unpractised hand at golf when they all arrived at the links his friends carefully placed the little carbonated sphere upon the tee and told their aged neophyte that he must try to send this little painted ball to the first hole plainly marked by the distant waving red flag towards which they pointed the stalwart old man swung his club valiantly hit the golf ball a square ringing blow and watched it eagerly as it made its long swift flight towards the far-off putting green his three friends all loudly congratulating him upon his stroke went with him in his silent search for the ball finally they found it lying just three or four inches from the edge of the first hole a look of exultant astonishment was upon their faces a look of keen disappointment upon the face of the old man gee i missed it he muttered in disgust his stroke had been the traditional stroke of the ignorant lucky beginner he had unwittingly accomplished a feat beyond the dream of the trained expert something similar to this triumphant accomplishment of the golf links has occasionally happened in the realm of storytelling an untrained narrator with a good tale to tell and with a natural instinct to select the dramatic incidents and arrange them luckily in effective sequence has held his hearers in continuously rapt attention and won from them at the close of his story round upon round of spontaneous applause but as the literary world has grown older and more mature in its aesthetic judgments it has naturally grown more exacting as narrator after narrator has told his stories the critical public and the academic critics have come to impose certain definite technical demands demands not so definite or so exacting however that the splendor of success in certain ways has not pardoned even rather glaring neglects and defects along certain other concurrent ways now it has been my pleasant task during the recent months to read or to reread scores upon scores of short stories that have been published in the atlantic monthly my object has been to select from the atlantic files some of the best and most representative of these narratives for publication in book form and thus make these significant stories more readily available for the college school and the reading public out of this study as it has combined and recombined with all my impressions of past readings have come certain convictions that have grown more persistent as the reading and the selecting have progressed the net result of this thinking i may at the beginning assert has been to expand and liberalize my convictions concerning the art and technique of short story writing the choice of theme is multitudinous the methods of allowable treatment generously variable the emphasis upon character plot and setting easily shiftable and the ultimate effects as diversified as our human moods and interests contrary to the concurrently repeated assertion there is i am convinced no strict atlantic type of story at least none so rigorously conceived as not to allow unquestioned commendation of the narrative art of such varied personalities as bret hart thomas bailey aldrich sarah orne jewett john galsworthy mrs cummer mrs gerald e nesbitt jack london or indeed that whole luminous galaxy of skilled story writers many of them without fame who for the past sixty years have been contributing the best of their literary selves to the atlantic yet a study of these contributions of such varied types convinces one of certain large demands which each successive editor has with somewhat latitudinarian rigor pretty positively held in mind while he was determining the worth of the given product what we may be interested in asking are these larger and more persistent demands the unified impression 
perhaps the most obvious requirement is that one upon which edgar allan poe in his brilliant critical essays on the art of the short story laid the strongest stress the demand that the narrator produce an unquestioned unified effect or impression an examination of the narrative method of the old metrical romances and of many of the arabian nights tales will by contrast illustrate poe's comment in those writings there was often no apparent plan the hero started out and had an adventure this the storyteller narrated as episode number one the hero continued and had another adventure similar or dissimilar to the first this we recognize as episode number two and thus the story continued until the narrator's powers of invention or endurance were exhausted we close the reading with no sense of satisfied unity no oneness of impression at the beginning of the story the writer of these romances and tales apparently had no definitely preconceived plan he allowed no foreshadowing of catastrophe he was careless alike of both beginning and end he made no conscious use of suspense setting character contrast reverting narrative climax or any of the numerous devices that make up the techniques of modern short story writing more particularly did he ignore the principle of unified impression unified impression secured by character domination while unity of impression is the sovereign demand in the modern short story the ways in which this impression may be secured possess interesting variety one of the most important of these ways is evident in the pervading or directing influence of some strongly dominant character events move in accordance with the will of some one person or it may be some group of persons with closely related powers and aims an interesting example of single character domination is seen in miss sherwood's story the clearest voice alice the wife has been dead five years yet it is her personality that still pervades and governs the home her spirit of kindly interest her instinct for the aesthetic her household control all these have persisted through the long months that have intervened since her death but it is when the husband is faced by the temptation to accept an inheritance which legally though not justly belongs to him it is then that the influence of the wife's assertive character silently and determinedly dictates the correct decision the husband's pressing financial difficulties the urgings of the relatives the unquestioned legality of the bequest these are all finally swept aside by the subtle workings of a quietly persisting ethical force sometimes an author reveals the strength and wisdom of one of his characters by allowing this character to yield to the wisdom and domination of another i am thinking of mrs Comer's story the wealth of timmy zimmerman the atlantic monthly volume 113 page 733 as we read the first part of this narrative we are interested only in timmy zimmerman and the personal character problems which the huge profits of the tobacco trust suddenly thrust upon this uncultured but good-souled parvenu we watch him in his early struggles so full of energy and bold emprise we rejoice with him in his significant financial triumphs and later we watch him as he tries by an expensive building enterprise by tours through europe by the rapid and careless driving of his ten thousand dollar red automobile to win back the nervous contentment that was the happy companion of those early years of adventurous poverty he dominates each separate situation but he does not solve his problem it is only when he meets molly betterton and sees himself as analyzed by her candid native acumen that he learns his own weakness and the true potentialities of his wealth her character is strong enough to win dominion over him it is not strong enough to dominate the story and lure the reader away from the controlling interest in the personality whose career the reader has so intently watched the unity of impression is firmly and continuously centered in the portrayal of jimmy zimmerman's character and it is that which tautly holds the reader's attention in leash a more recent story that secures its chief interest from character portrayal is mr arthur russell taylor's mr squam 
mr squim is a traveling man who sells mercury rubber tires he wears clothes that arrest attention broad striped affairs that seem stripes before they were clothes his talk is profusely interlarded with vulgar but picturesque slang he is far removed from the academy brought into direct contrast with the reverend alan dare and professor william emory brown his crudity is the more grossly apparent it is later enhanced by the glimpse we get of his room extremely denish smitingly red as to walls oppressive with plush upholstery a huge deer head jutting from over the mantel divided honors with the highly colored september morn affrontingly framed on a shelf stood a small bottle it contained a finger of mr squim amputated years before in alcohol but in the midst of a railroad wreck we lose all thought of these banalities and crudities we take mr squim for what he really is a genuine large-hearted efficient minister unto his fellow men the impression he creates dominates the entire situation of the classic stories which admirably illustrate this method of securing a unity of impression through concentrated character interest we like to revert to bret hart's tennessee partner it is of small moment that we do not know this man's name of small moment indeed that he seems throughout his mining career at sandy bar to have been content to have his personality dimmed by the somewhat more luminous aura of tennessee but when tennessee's repeated offenses bring him to trial before judge lynch and finally to his doom on the ominous tree at the top of morsley hill tennessee's partner comes suddenly upon the scene and overpoweringly dominates the situation we close our reading of the story completely impressed by the devoted loyalty of tennessee's partner the loyalty that creates the unified impression and this same unity of impression thus secured in the clearest voice the wealth of timmy zimmerman mr squim and tennessee's partner by concentrated interest in character is easily discernible in scores of other stories the method is artistically employed by hawthorne in the great stone face in maxim gorky's chalcatchy turgenev's a leer of the steps j m barry's cree query and myra drolby thomas nelson page's mars chan henry james's the real thing joseph conrad's the informer and such well-known atlantic stories as anna fuller's the boy esther tiffany's anna maria florence gilmore's little brother ellen macubin's rosita charles dobby's the failure clarkson crane's snipe and christina christo's babinchick indeed the list is well-nigh inexhaustible and is constantly being increased by the many gifted writers who enriching our current literature see in personal character the germ of story interest unified impression secured by plot just as in looking at a finished piece of artistic tapestry we get a sense of harmonious design so in contemplating the events of a well-told story our sense of artistic completeness is satisfied by the skill displayed in the weaving and interweaving of incident such weaving and interweaving as bring the significant events into the immediate foreground and group the items of lesser moment in such an unobtrusive manner as to merge them into harmony with the main design preceding the beginning of any story we assume the existence of a state of repose either there is nothing happening or if events are happening they are simply happening in the atmosphere of dull and inconsequential routine and are accordingly without the pale of narrative notice then suddenly or gradually something happens to disturb this repose and to this initial exciting force are traceable the succeeding events with such varied culminations as prosperity or poverty or dejection tragedy or joy or restored calm or any one of the multitudinous finalities that life brings with her in her equipage the whole principle of plot as here briefly analyzed is simply and artistically revealed in mr ernest starr's the clearer sight 
an admirable example of a story whose unity is secured largely by the effective handling of situation and incident to noakes the young scientist who is the central character in the story the master chemist henry maxineff has given certain general suggestions for a formula which will give an explosive of great value and of high potential power the young man following these general lines discovers that by slight additions and alterations he can successfully work out the formula and immediately sell his secret to a foreign government the sum he would thus secure would amply justify him in proposing marriage to becky hollam the girl of his choice we watch him in his brisk experiments and in his conclusive yielding to the temptation we see him betraying his employer and at the same time failing to meet the standard of confidence which is demanded by the girl he loves right in the midst of these scientific successes and these ethical failures comes the terrible explosion in the laboratory where noakes was working in secret he is blinded by the accident permanently he thinks harassed by his sufferings more particularly by his spiritual sufferings he makes his confessions to mr maxineff and miss hallam and looks despairingly toward the empty future the story closes with the physician's hope that the loss of his sight is after all but temporary as we end our reading and view the events in retrospect we are conscious of having seen the various threads of interest woven into a complete and unified design again the principles of plot structure are clearly seen quietly creating their unified impression in a sea change one of alice brown's homely stories cynthia miller a new england housewife had lived for years her life of dull routine in an isolated mountain farm eight miles from the nearest village her husband timothy was a son of the soil made out of the earth and not many generations removed from that maternity cynthia gradually comes to despise her life and her husband's crude carelessness exemplified by his habitual animal aura and his newly greased boots by the open oven door with little ado but with grim determination she leaves him and goes to the seaside home of her sister frances cynthia is taken ill but is at length cured by the kindly village doctor and the silent ministrations of the neighboring sea timothy changed by the sudden departure of his wife and the opportunity for introspection that his lonely life now brings him shakes off a bit of earthiness and goes after several weeks to find his wife we listen to the brief reconciliation and see timothy begin to breathe in new life of aroused love and appreciation the author's skillful manipulation of the action makes us live in the glow of a clearly perceived oneness of impression there are of course thousands of stories which secure this singleness of effect by a similar skill in the handling of situations and incidents among these many we need mention only a few whose unity is largely secured by plot interest thomas bailey aldrich's marjorie daw maupassant's the necklace poe's murders in the rue morgue stockton's a tale of negative gravity and the lady or the tiger kipling's without benefit of clergy pushkin's the shot acorn and doyle's the adventures of sherlock holmes and jack london's a day's lodging unified impression secured by setting perhaps the most significant critical comment on setting the third important element in the story weaving process that secures oneness of impression is that frequently quoted conversation of stevenson with graham balfour you may said stevenson take a certain atmosphere and get action and persons to express it i'll give you an example the merry men there i began with the feeling of one of those islands on the west coast of scotland and i gradually developed the story to express the sentiment with which the coast affected me there is no sensitive reader who will not sympathize with this feeling and immediately understand how the atmosphere of a particular place will act upon inventive genius and become the exciting force for the production of a story the squalid surroundings in the city slums the gay glamour of a garishly lighted casino the unending stretch of desert waste 
the dim twilight or the shrouded darkness of the pine forest the bleakness of the beaches in midwinter the sounding cataracts haunting one like a passion how rich in storied suggestiveness may be each of these to him who already has within him the instinct of story or romance how the mood of a place may affect its influence is well expressed in the opening passages of john galsworthy's buttercup night which sensitively analyzes the feelings for an unnamed bit of land in the west country as the author experienced them one sunday night of a bygone early june Quote, why is it that in some places there is such a feeling of life being all one not merely a long picture show for human eyes but a single breathing glowing growing thing of which we are no more important a part than the swallows and magpies the foals and sheep in the meadows the sycamores and ash trees and flowers in the fields the rocks and little bright streams or even the long fleecy clouds and their soft shouting drivers the winds true we register these parts of being and they so far as we know do not register us yet it is impossible to feel in such places as i speak of the busy dry complacent sense of being all that matters which in general we humans have so strongly in these rare spots that are always in the remote country untouched by the advantages of civilization one is conscious of an enwrapping web or mist of spirit the glamorous and wistful wraith of all the vanished shapes that once dwelt there in such close comradeship End quote. we can readily see as we read buttercup night that it is the atmosphere of the place that subtly dictates the telling of the story and at the end leaves the reader breathing this delicious june air and living within the charmed romance of this accumulated mass of magical yellow what happens is interesting but it is interesting largely because the incidents are fused and integrated with the hovering spirit of place and time here as dominating in their charm as is the weird mysterious usher homestead in its gloom while such stories as stevenson's merry men and galsworthy's buttercup night and poe's the fall of the house of usher illustrate in a particularly striking way the dominant influence of setting we recall scores upon scores of stories that have an added power because their authors have shown skill in the creation of a permeating and directing environment among the more famous of these stories are sarah orne jewett's the queen's twin israel zangwill's they that walk in darkness prosper merimee's matteo falcone hardy's wessex tales lafcadio hearn's yoma jack london's children of the forest john fox's christmas eve on lonesome edith wyatt's in november and mrs gerard's the moth of peace unified impression secured by theme another element of the story which we find interesting to discover and analyze is the author's dominant theme what in the older days we might have unapologetically called the moral of the story but along with the development of the technique of the short story there came a school of critics and writers that shied terribly at the mention of the word moral and such writers as stevenson often seemed overconscious of its lurking danger in such consciousness stevenson wrote wonderful stories of adventure and mystery such as treasure island and the sire de maliatrat's door yet the native instinct towards emphasis upon theme allowed him to write such powerful ethical stories as markheim and dr jekyll and mr hyde but in these as in most of the modern thematic stories the ethical truth pervades rather than intrudes it is so firmly woven into incident and character and surroundings and natural dramaturgy that its identity is not exposed to naked bareness but combines with other elements to produce a perfect unity through harmony of tone and effect among the recent atlantic story writers 
this harmonious linking is seen happily existent in the deft workmanship of mrs c a p cummer and ann douglas sedgwick in each number of three notable trilogies which these gifted writers have contributed there is an artistic treatment of three notable themes in mrs cummer's preliminaries the kinzer portraits and the long inheritance we find the author's implied comments on engagement marriage and divorce in ann douglas sedgwick's unconnected floral trilogy hepaticus carnations and pansies there is in turn reflected miss sedgwick's attitude towards three themes which are less concrete and which demand a longer phrasing in the first there is the world-old story of the noble spirited woman's love and sacrifice and ardent wishings for her self-victimized son in carnations we have the story of a husband rupert wilson released from the bondage of an unfortunate infatuation and restored to the sanity of love in pansies we have a generous tribute to quiet sentiment developed by a study in character contrasts the simple-hearted woman loving a simple garden contrasted with the kindly disposed but worldly environed mrs lenard fond of display and dorothy perkins effects and laying a disproportioned stress upon the expensive and the modern in none of these six stories is there the slightest suggestion that the narrative has been conceived in the spirit of propaganda it would be impossible to say even that it was the underlying theme which gave the initial conception to the narrative and directed its progress any one of these six stories i can fancy beginning in plot or in character or in setting plot character setting and theme all are here but all are so happily combined that i feel no disproportionate emphasis and hence no forcing of a technical element i only know that personally when i think over these stories i find the theme of each leaving its strong and lingering impression what is true regarding this effective combination of elements in these stories of mrs Commer's and miss sedgwick's is of course true of many of the atlantic stories which i have been reading perhaps in the majority of the best there is such a thorough merging of all the elements that the final impression falls upon neither character nor plot nor setting nor theme the author has had something worth while to relate and he has related it in a simple and natural way all unconscious of or happily triumphant over any studied technique in the art of narration it has indeed been a conviction in the minds of some of the atlantic editors that most persons even though untrained in manipulating the story maker's gear have at least one experience real or imagined that is abundantly worth telling and worth writing unconsciously of course this artless narrator might throw in bold relief theme character setting or plot or he might unconsciously merge these separate interests the woman writers aside from the mere contemplation of story element technique there are many other interesting observations which naturally come to one who reads critically the currently published fiction he who examines the recent atlantic files will be immediately impressed by the dominant place held by women writers of the short story mrs wharton mrs Comer, mrs gerald sarah orne jewett alice brown mary anton zephine humphrey edith ronald merrilis margaret prescott montague kathleen norris e nesbitt laura spencer porter anna fuller edith wyatt margaret lynn elizabeth ash anne douglas sedgwick elsie singmaster margaret sherwood among the atlantic contributors we should find it difficult indeed to match this list with an equal number of men equally gifted in storytelling power but even if we should succeed in such a fatuous pairing of talent we should still be impressed with the high place attained by the woman writers high in contrast with the place which they have attained in painting sculpture architecture drama and music and why this high attainment in the realm of the short story perhaps it is partially due to the lighter winged fancy native in the feminine mind a fancy that roves with more natural ease and grace among the animals and flowers of earth 
among the clouds and stars and spirits of the sky among the demon haunted grottoes of the underworld from all these easily directed journeys perhaps it turns more naturally to the penetrable secrets of human motive penetrable however only to those hearts which yield quickly spontaneously even wantonly to the springs of love hate beauty justice jealousy fear vengeance and the silent routine of daily duty doing all this of its natural self the heart can more readily guide the mind in the deft record of vicarious action leastwise to make a simple record of a real or imagined experience is a task which can be more easily done by girls than by boys as boys and girls grow into maturity and the desire for contact with life increases the masculine mind finds its natural outlet in business in wrestling with the soil in contests of law and at the present moment alas in the chaos of relentless war woman's sphere though continually enlarging is still relatively narrowed and she seeks her freedom in the realm of imagination thus identifying herself oftentimes in the workaday contests of men this mental exercise within the wide gamut of imagined emotions naturally helps her to enter sympathetically into varied contests and it is perhaps because of her broadened understanding that she is fuller and truer in her written record the feminine mind moreover is more observant of detail and more ready to perceive a lack of harmony in arrangement and while mere fullness of observation might in isolated cases lead to incontinent garrulousness the generous flow is usually held in sufficient check by that nicer feminine perception of an aesthetic effect that dictates shearing and compression perhaps the widening of the educational field the world's fuller acknowledgment of women's varied ability her easier mastery of delicate technique a more habitual access to a writing pad perhaps all these combine with other facts and circumstances to encourage her in this prolific output of marketable fiction at any rate the fact is easily apparent the stamp of authenticity a further interesting fact revealed in an examination of atlantic narratives is the encouragement of that type of story which carries with it the stamp of an authentic atmosphere more than a generation ago this magazine was printing the stories of bret hart stories that revealed with great accuracy and skill and sympathy the spirit of the california mining camp bret hart had lived and breathed the grim and romantic spirit of this environment fusing this experience with an imagination that emotionalized a native instinct for storytelling bret hart was able to lend to his writing a verisimilitude that easily won the reader's interest in the charm and novelty of that strenuous and elemental western life while the work of bret hart perhaps most strikingly illustrates this power of authentic portrayal of experience and place there are scores of atlantic stories that employ the same general method sarah orne jewett in such stories as the queen's twin the life of nancy and a drummit shepherd has admirably recreated the simple life of rural new england lafcadio hearn has realistically brought to us the spirit of japan jacob riss has portrayed for us many pictures of new york tenement life joseph husband has brought us into the atmosphere of industrialism h g dwight and charles johnson have allowed us to breathe the spirit of orientalism and scores of other writers such as dallas lore sharp e morley margaret prescott montague abraham ribbony mary anton mildred aldrich simeon strunsky after they had lived their separate experiences have shared with us the intimate memories which those personal experiences have bequeathed sordidness rejected the atlantic traditions for the most part have rejected the harrowing and the sordid and the meretricious contrasted with the tone of tragic realism so often dominant in gorky dostoevsky turgenev maupassant and zola we usually find in the pages of the atlantic an emphasis upon themes which suggest a gentler and more humane spirit 
the winds of heaven do of course sometimes blow over places that are bleak barren and desolate they shriek and moan through winter wilds and sometimes the human mood that corresponds to this despair has found its reflection in stories which the atlantic has printed but the mission of the magazine has in general been in the sunlit fields or near the hearth fire's glow if it sometimes has witnessed tragedy it has never found delight in the disclosure of grimness for grimness sake it has been more watchful of scenes within the commonplaces of human action here the writers have found themes of quiet pathos of homely humor and of rich romance small wonder indeed if since august nineteen fourteen grimmer scenes than usual should not sometimes shadow the pages but even so the writers have not yet lost their sanity their hopefulness or their quiet sense of humor possibilities within the future after these comments on the more dominant characteristics of a short story it is natural to inquire into the possible future of the art it is apparent that writers are paying careful attention to technique and there is real danger to the art if technique is to be too narrowly interpreted and too slavishly followed a credulous acceptance of a guide has always worked havoc in the field of creative literature aristotle and horace and longinus to revert to a literary period now far distant showed admirable critical acumen but it may be sincerely questioned whether they enhanced the worth of grecian and roman literature we may be quite sure that the critical writings of neither boileau nor pope deepened or improved french or english poetry will our short stories be any better here in america because brander matthews bliss perry clayton hamilton henry s canby w b pitkin miss albright miss ashman and a score of others have written so entertainingly about them as i have read these criticisms and as i have seen new writers apparently influenced by these criticisms and by the methods obvious in poe bret hart kipling and o henry i have been reluctantly made to feel that we were perhaps on the verge of yielding to the technique of the telling rather than to the substance of the experience where art becomes too self-conscious and too critical it sacrifices spontaneity and elemental power and smothers itself in the wrappings of its self-woven web reliance upon technique and long practice in its use will help crudeness to rise to mediocrity but the process will never lift the mediocre writer to the plane of the supremely excellent or the austerely great perhaps the present danger lies partly in the attitude of the magazine editor whose scepter is his checkbook let us not deceive ourselves literature is now a business or if not wholly commercialized it is acutely sensitive to the laws of the trade the purely commercial editors with their eyes riveted on the main chance have come to recognize the power of technique and to it they have been paying bountiful tribute the public has in turn learned to expect the sudden start the swift pace the placarded climax the clever paradox the crisp repartee the pinch beck style the barred realism the concluding click it is all very perfect and very regular and the editor in accepting the manuscript that adheres to each conventional requirement encloses his check for two hundred dollars in a letter that contains an order for a half dozen more of the identical nature one of the deplorable adjuncts of this procedure is that the editor often realizes the emptiness of this technically correct story and his own best literary judgment spurns it but trying to objectify what his clientele would applaud he pays the price and orders more conversely a story with genuine substance and sincere feeling comes to his desk he reads it and approves then he asks that fateful question what will my reading public say he concludes that they will note the utter lack of climax of cleverness of ingenuity of realistic contact with unadorned everydayness he closes the incident by a return of the manuscript with a printed rejection slip enclosed but this procedure is sometimes happily reversed an editor has had the fortitude to ignore the fancied judgment of his readers and has relied upon his own impressions of what constitutes literary worth 
he is conscious that the story he has accepted is written in utter ignorance or in total disregard of traditional propriety and the laws of modern technique yet it carries a message it reveals character it shows real thinking powers accepted and published as was arthur russell taylor's mr squim it has been enthusiastically received by its readers there is one final conviction that emerges from the varied and multitudinous impressions that comes from the reading of all these stories every individual has an experience worth narrating and most individuals have scores upon scores of experiences real or imagined that are worth narrating to succeed in the attempt one does not necessarily need to be a conscious master of technique he must of course have a reasonably firm command of his vernacular indeed to succeed in any large degree he must attain unquestioned mastery and fittingly fashion his style to the theme immediately at hand he should have a sense of organization that deftly orders the proper sequence of events and skillfully adjusts both minor and major incidents to secure a unified impression there is i am convinced no single minor rule that critics may formulate which will stand a rigid acid test genius abrogates every law talent may abrogate most laws a great experience a great situation a great theme a great character a great scene a great emotion any one of these may direct even an ordinary writer to successful narration the skilled storyteller will win success from even scanty material but the scanty material will be enriched by a sense of humor an ingenious fancy a felicitous style a controlling imagination a deft craftsmanship or a keen perception of the value and regulation of detail. End of introduction. End of Atlantic Narratives.